to work in mental health settings and work alongside staff and patients to make a difference, even if it's only a small one. My time living in hostels and a refuge alongside my mental health also meant that I had not worked for a few years and therefore thought voluntary work would help me get back into my working life. I also hoped that it would help me with the last bit of my own recovery, give me a purpose, a routine, structure and value, all of which I lacked beforehand. I started off my voluntary work at the COVID-19 vaccine site, helping the site run smoothly. And not long after, I picked up the telephone befriending, calling service users during the pandemic, ensuring they had someone to talk to. My telephone befriender constantly tells me how much she appreciates me calling and how much it helps her, and therefore I still keep in contact with her, even though the service has ended. I then went on to do some voluntary work with the Recovery College, helping to create a podcast around mental health and recovery which is then released on their platform. The role had got me involved with the planning, recording, presenting and occasional editing and organisation of guests coming on at times. The connections I've made through these roles will last a lifetime and I like to see the positive impacts of the work will last longer. I then started at Westlands in September, helping with activities on the ward once a week alongside the activity coordinator, interacting with patients and encouraging positive wellbeing. A few months later, the activity coordinator moved to a different ward. However, Westlands had just hired a clinical psychologist, um, which I believe is there somewhere, um, and somehow managed to convince her to take me on as a volunteer, which she probably regretted. Um, when I started at Westlands, I had no confidence whatsoever. I didn't want to speak or share my opinion in case I said the wrong thing. It sounded dumb or stupid, and I never believed that anything I said was worthwhile hearing. The thought of doing skills and narrative groups on the ward is something that I tried to avoid multiple times, 
always saying no or just totally avoiding the question when asked if I wanted to take that leave, the leave that week because I was too scared of messing up. At this point, I doubted my ability, my abilities, my degree and my career because I never thought that I would be able to have that confidence, which is vital to any psychology role. However, even, even though my anxiety still gets in the way and I experience it daily, I managed to overcome this and I'm now able to lead groups on the ward regularly, which even in January, I never thought would happen. The amount my confidence has grown from volunteering, especially at Westlands, is unbelievable, and I'm really thankful for Em's help me bring that up. I also helped create some of the patient leaflets for the group so they have something to take away with them, which we hope that they look at them. Um, so far, while volunteering at Westlands alongside Em, I was sat on assessments, reviews, MDT, discharge meetings, etc., enabling me to gain first hand knowledge of how these, um, of how these working sessions run. This was a massive change of perspective from what I had previously seen as a patient, and I believe enables me to look at things from both the patient's and staff's point of view. Alongside this, I have also helped with a file review, learning a new skill that will likely come in handy and still occasionally help out, and still occasionally help out with activities alongside the activity coordinators, enabling me to interact with patients on the ward more. My volunteering journey has not been easy from the start, with many challenges, including loss and illness, causing me the need to take a short break, alongside the issues and pressure of trying to finish my degree, while having my laptop and computer break and moving house with a week and a half before my final deadline. I have had times where I doubted everything I was doing. When I wanted to give up, I thought my aspirations were out of reach. However, through volunteering, I have grown so much as a person in various aspects of my life. And I'm forever grateful for the opportunities and support I have been given from all my voluntary roles through voluntary services um, and especially M. Um, and for the first time in a long time, I'm, I'm happy and enjoy what I'm doing, which is all I've ever wanted from the start. I'm really excited to see what these next couple of months bring before I go on to complete my master's degree and find pay, paid work. But I truly believe that my volunteering experience through the trust has prepared me for these next steps. Well, thank you so much, Abby. And uh, for those of you who may not uh, know, M is Emily uh, McGowan, who's a clinical psychologist at Westlands. And in fact, actually, that's quite a new position, actually, to have that psychologist based in that unit. And I think it's already reaping rewards, not just obviously from what we've heard from Abby, but also more generally in terms of the staff team at Westlands. So great to hear from you again, Abby. Um, and uh, give our best to Em when you see her. So um, I see Dean. Sorry, Caroline, I'm, I am here. <laughs> oh, sorry, Em. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if like my camera thing is just I can I see me, see but you. I don't think anyone else oh. can. But did you want to? Did you want to add anything? Em? Sorry about that. <laughs> I just was like, can they see me? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I've just been in post since November. Um, and basically when I started was when um, it was suggested that Abby join me. So I like, because I don't even have supervisor training yet, I was exploring that before it could all be set up. But Abby's just been an absolute asset to the team. And obviously, like, I am just the psychologist on the ward. So having someone to help has just been just brilliant, really. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she, she's done amazing. Thanks, Em. Thanks very much. Sorry, I, I missed you there. I was just focused on looking at Abby. Uh, <laughs> there we go. OK, um, a few questions and comments, I'm sure. Dean and then I've got my, uh, Lynn and then I've got Michael. Dean. Thanks very much. And uh, Abby, I had the pleasure of hearing you when you did the similar uh, presentation to the governor's meeting. So uh, many congratulations uh, on your uh, on your uh, degree uh, as well. Uh, just listening and reflecting and something I said last time, but uh, the way that you just articulated the value of work and i know many people that work in recovery see work as an important part of that and you were saying about sort of you know routine and uh, purpose and feeling valued at work and it's just you you you, you express that so well um when often we can see work can't we as toil or something to avoid and yet it's been so beneficial and it's just really to reflect on us isn't it about the important job that we do as an organization employing those sort of three thousand or so people um, providing work for them and, and the work that we're trying to do in terms of uh, their health and well-being. So, so thank you for that and uh, and expressing work and all the very best with the master's degree. And I'm I'm sure any organisation that gets you will be delighted to have you as an employee. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dean. Um, Lynn. 
Yes, thank you. I believe brilliant um, to hear your experiences and really well done on your degree. Um, I have some responsibility as well for overseeing the Recovery College. I believe so thank you very much for your contributions to that too, So, which is really important work for us. I just wanted to ask you about, as we are constantly looking at how we improve that pathway of experience for our people that we work with from volunteering to recovery college into paid roles um, within the trust and you're clearly a model example of um, how that pathway can work but we're also very conscious that we've got more work to do Abby as well so in terms of your volunteering experience is there anything that you can point me towards that we could do to improve and enhance that for people, we really want to encourage people to, you know, really get the most out of that. We get so much back um, as an organisation as well. So if there is anything you think we can do better, it'd be great to hear that. Thank you. I think a lot of it's just about like promoting what volunteering is and what voluntary services is, and then finding like someone to volunteer with who you can like get along with, who like you kind of have that kind of connection, that kind of relationship with, because I think that kind of makes all the difference because me and them have quite a good relationship we get along really really well and I think that makes like a huge impact to how my experience as a volunteer is especially at Westlands which is the only one I actually like face to face. Okay thanks Abby Lee. Michael. Uh, thank you Chair. Um, congratulations Abby. Again I think most of the points and uh, uh, questions that I was going to ask have been already covered, but I just wanted to congratulate you because I think it takes lots of guts to come and speak about yourself in front of people, uh, most of who are probably strangers to you. And I think uh, it's it's quite commendable that um, in, in spite of the last couple of years, I don't know, I don't, I don't need to reiterate uh, how things have been. You have been able to overcome that, and and I think the trust has played a small role in only supporting you with your own resilience. And I think uh, I'm really proud that uh, we have been able to be a part of that success that you have uh, demonstrated very clearly that you are able to do. So thank you very much for coming in today. Thanks, Michael. Um, Hani. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, firstly, just to echo all of those comments and sentiments, Abby, and, uh, you know, again, I had the privilege of speaking, to, uh, listening to you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my question was directed more at Emily, uh, but maybe Abby could contribute. I, I, just wondering, Emily, what the learning outcomes from Abby's stories are, just to help us get some more Abby's. Um, I'm going to go out on limb and say she almost sounds unique to me in terms of now having had the pleasure of listening to her twice, but... Uh, clear the impact we've had on her and what she's been able to give us back. But is there anything we take from that that enables us to to improve almost our volunteering recruitment and retention processes? Uh, I think you're right, Annie, in that it's um, Abby is very unique. She's an expert by experience and has done a lot in terms of self development already, despite like just the undergrad psychology versus my um, doctorate training, for example. She's more and more self-aware we've had conversations about you know do you want to come into this assessment with me or do you think this content will be a bit much for you we've had those kinds of conversations that are really useful and really important to consider as well because obviously the unit can get very intense so i think in terms of her development it's been quite appropriate for this ward for example um because of her experiences and her own self-awareness um i think other volunteers would very much thrive in different environments i think it's just staff being able to be aware that it exists because it's not something I'd considered and I think OT on the ward have just started thinking about getting a volunteer as well because activity is uh, picking up or planning more things or um, hopefully improving patient engagements and so on so um, now that you know Abby's here she demonstrates how well it works because the team itself works with her quite well as well um, so I hope that answered your question. <laughs> that's really interesting about the learning across to OT as well. I think that's that's occupational therapist for anyone watching in and thinking what's that stand for. Um, I think that's really interesting because it's quite hard, isn't it, organising activities for you know a diverse group of people who may have the different things they're interested in at any one time. Um, so that's a really interesting read across from your experience, Abby Lee, and that it can work. That's great to hear. Um, Michelle. 
yeah, good morning, Abby and, and Emily. Great to see both of you again. And obviously, I had the privilege of listening to the the, the conversation uh, at, at the governors. But just to say, congratulations on the degree. But it's a great case study, and I think a lot of the points have been raised about how we utilise that case study. Because what a great presentation in front of a, a a group of people that you don't know. And virtual is always a bit more difficult, I think. But also, I think from the service user aspect as well, because the benefits that the service users get as well from that that interaction. So I think it's a really great case study that picking up Hanif's point really that we need to build on um, as much as we can and I think I said last time please let's keep in touch from a career point of view and what have you um, but just really really great way to start but also let's think about how we can maximise um, your experiences and, and obviously you are absolutely unique but I think there's some real real nuggets there that we can build on and I don't think we should lose them so we'll make sure we take those back in as well but thank you so much good to see you again. Thanks Michelle. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, morning, Abby Lee and Emily, and thanks. I've enjoyed the story for the second time as well. Um, by the way, I have yet to see real evidence of the uh, the budget regard, but I'm sure he exists. Um, my question is about, well, congratulations on your degree, and I know you're intending to go and do a master's. And just really a, just a reminder that the Trust does uh, has an active research programme. So when it comes to the point where you're thinking about your research, uh, you know, feel free to come and have a chat with the people in charge of the research programme, because I think the the value of applied research is so great in uh, in our organization so it's one to put on your radar for the future okay so what's the name of the budgie abby lee again remind me i can show you one if you want <laughs> yeah go on we've got to see the budgie please <laughs> oh gosh oh we're getting a full tour now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you might be fun to I'm glad you've got that Velux window shut. I can fly there you go. Oh my goodness. That's a yeah. really fancy budgie apartment as that well, is, I believe. Yeah. I'm really impressed. Thank you. Lovely. That's a very much a des res for a, a budgie, I would suggest. Yeah. Uh, oh, is a pretty boy. Uh, Michael. Just a quick comment, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, picking up on what uh, Stuart has earlier mentioned about research, um, I, I, was, I was going to say that we, we focus a lot on quantitative research, but I think this is definitely qualitative here, which I think we should celebrate and publish uh, in one respect. Another aspect, uh, Abby, yes, as, as Stuart said, in your future endeavours, do, do get in touch with us if you need to. I mean, you're already in contact with us as a volunteer, but if you need any support with your research projects and things like that, please don't hesitate to contact me. And later on, you'll have Catherine Hart coming in as well, who is our assistant director of research. So uh, any one of us uh, will be able to kind of guide you and direct you. OK. Brilliant. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Abby, Lee, anything else you'd like to say? I hope you're having a celebratory week this week with your results? Uh, not really. We had team day on Tuesday at Westlands, which was my official results day. So and then I'm off back in a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> OK, well, look, take care of yourself. And obviously, you know, Michael's mentioned about connecting up with yourself and maybe Em as well about the research side of things as well, which I think is a really good way of incorporating you know what you've what you've been doing but also the masters too uh so hopefully those connections will be made and em thank you so much em uh you know these these sort of opportunities don't work without the staff supporting and you've been pivotal in all of this so thank you as well have a great summer ladies <laughs> thank you all very much take care brilliant bye bye, -bye. Great. Um, really, um, you know, really good to sort of, you know, just hear about more of Abby Lee's progression and the results and everything. And it's what, an, what, a, what a good example of how, you know, taking some of these opportunities and doing things differently can make uh, to the organisation um, in so many different ways. And thank you for all your contributions um, there as well. OK, so moving on chairs report, I just want to flag a few things. Obviously, the, the last is four weeks since we last met. Uh, Michelle's covering it in her report, but we we managed to get um, uh, through all the interviews for the new head of corporate affairs and for the medical director and were able to um, uh, offer uh, positions arising out of that. So it was pretty intense few days in being involved in that, but really glad to have a positive outcome. Uh, again, Michelle and I uh, spent a day, I think, in Scarborough uh, uh, this last month 
doing two things really. One was taking the opportunity um, to uh, meet with our, our community district and specialist nurses in both the hub in Scarborough and in Eastfield. And that was really interesting because obviously they are at the front line of our, our sort of community services, um, particularly in terms of primary care. And it was really good to hear uh, from them about how um, some of the changes that have been made to the service of bedding in, but also to obviously hear because all those nurses are very much involved in visiting people in their homes. And I know Michelle's going to talk about this later, um, but obviously the cost of living situation for them in terms of fuel costs is 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 key. And it was really interesting to sort of hear directly some feedback from them about how that's affecting them, but also how the supervisory staff are trying to minimise uh, as much as as possible without um, reducing any contact with patients, um, the sort of journeys that people have by being smart about it. And that was really interesting to get the feedback on there. I would have to say, and I think Michelle and I would both agree on this, um, so in, in Scarborough, in, in the building there, um, I have to say there were some of the best notice boards I've ever seen uh, so far in the Trust. Uh, th that's not to say there aren't better ones out there, but it was really interesting to see how, you know, they put together in the sort of staff room area, which is a really busy place, people coming in and out and, and what have you, both the uh, Chloe's uh, um, that they managed to put on a white writing board, five of them, but importantly, in very plain English, explain what that meant to them in terms of their work. And it was really good to see that uh, in that format. But also there was also a thank you board, which was lovely, but also other ways in which they were using these notice boards as a really easy way that if you were popping in, in between your, your work, getting a cup of tea, having a sandwich, you could really easily see some of these things. Uh, and and take it away with you. And I thought that was really, really helpful and important. But it was really great to hear from them. And also on the same day, we had the quarterly staff awards actually at Scarborough Rugby Union uh, Club, where at, we have long service awards to a variety of staff from different divisions. Uh, so that was really great. And to have it in person, because they've all been virtual so far for me, um, was really good as well. Um, but again, it was another way to sort of multitask because we actually provide physiotherapy services at the club itself. And we managed to pop up and see that too and meet one of the members staff who provides that service. So that was great. We've had a governor induction for new governors since we last met, a council of governors meeting where the um, the proposals for development support were agreed by all the governors. Thank you to the board who've all inputted into that. And just to say for our, our, our NEDS catch up, uh, we were great. It was great to hear from Kate York, who's the associate director of uh, psychology, who gave us an update on what was happening in the services there. So thanks to Kate uh, for providing that. Um, so that's really just the sort of main highlights I'd like to flag um, from my last month. Um, so thank you. Any questions on that? Nope. OK, over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, everybody. I've trusted everybody has read the, my paper as usual. I'll pull out a couple of headlines and then I'll leave it to my colleagues to update the relevant areas um, uh, from their particular portfolios. And um, there is one policy you'll notice um, for us to uh, approve, which is the digital clinical safety policy. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, obviously, I mentioned my challenge last time in relationship to uh, Health Stars. It's, it's noted there again, just thanks to everybody that contributed to that. And that was one of the major things from a Health Stars point of view this month in relationship to their report. There are a few team changes happening at Health Stars, but it was really good to have that, um, that, that challenge and, and support for, from the charity uh, funds uh, as well. Um, as uh, Caroline says, we have been successful in, in appointing uh, both a, a medical director and a corporate first post but just going through the technicalities of that so please bear with it it's slightly more complicated with it be the board level position because we've got fit fit for fit for purpose etc um but we will do some announcements as soon as we can and it's actually great to see fofa here and i'm not breaking any secrets there at all but um, it's great to see him observing the board but um there will be a, a, a long handover in relation to the medical director so uh dr michael will be with us for, for a few more months as we do that transition but more on that next month as we finalize that um 
as Caroline said, it was great to do some visits with with, with Caroline and, and to really see the, the, and feel the staff in relationship to our community services. They have undergone and are going through a massive transformation programme at the moment in relationship to community hubs. Um, and suffice to say, there was a mixed response to it, but I think overall it was felt to be positive and I think they could see the positive nature of that going forward. Um, it was also great. I did spend a bit of time in between the visits um, with our GP lead up there, Dr Iqbal. It was great to have some quality time with Iqbal just to talk about particularly, obviously, the GP pressures that we've got because that is one of our real pressurised areas is obviously the recruitment and retention of GP. So it was really great to get Iqbal's take on that and, and spend some time uh, with, with him. Um, I, as, as we've said, cost, cost of living, we are always talking about this in the executive team and I do pick it up a lot not just on visits but in my virtual meetings with staff and obviously the various sessions that we have meet Michelle exec etc as the exec um, we put a little resume on page four of my report um, just to give you a bit of an update page 29 in the pack of where we're up to so basically we've increased the least cow mileage rate by 10p and that was from April um, we've increased the regular user allowance from uh, those that after 3,500 from 20p to 45p. And again, that was from April, but we've since increased it from July um, up to 3,500 miles um, uh, by 5p. And we continue to pay the working from home allowance. I mean, one of the few organisations that do that. Obviously, we're constantly looking at what else we can do. And we have got some other thoughts in tray. Obviously, we take a stop check in relationship to our, co our colleagues in other areas and other trusts, and we're not an outlier, we're quite up there with um, some of the things that we do. And we also listen to what staff are saying about um, support vehicles, etc. Um, so we are constantly talking about it and we will constantly review it and we'll keep uh, keep the board updated. We have to be careful with some of the tax implications for some things that we want to support staff. So um, we are continuing to, to work through that. I'm going to pause because Mike's got his hand up and I presume it's on this subject, Mike. Did you want to come in rather than we get to the end and then come back yeah, again? Is that yeah, all right, Chair? Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks. That's, 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 that's very kind of you. If that's OK with you, Chair. Uh, no, no, not so. Um, it was just on, on the assistance. Um, I don't have an awareness of other trusts. Um, we were doing salary advances um, quite quickly. Uh, they're getting in touch with the local credit union. Uh, so I congratulate you on, on what you're doing. Um, but but there's still still more needs to be done, I think. And uh, there's also the opportunity in another trust actually to do some saving through the trust as well. But I think the credit union idea, even if it was our credit union, might be a real good thing. Yes, I think that's one of the things we discussed on Monday and things like school uniforms as well. But we've looked at the salary payments as well, and it's a bit more difficult. I know Ian's on the call, but and I know some organisations have gone went to weekly and are coming back to, to monthly because of some of the, the tax implications. So we, we are looking at all those mics. So watch your space. It's a constant, it's a constant yeah. conversation. Just because we've done this doesn't mean that oh. we're going to say we've done it and we're going to move on. We are looking at lots of different things, both to support staff as well. A direct message to Ian about the how we're doing this salary in it elsewhere yeah that'd be really helpful because we've thought about you know do we have because and we're looking at we're looking at um sickness rates in relationship to the end of the month because it's the end of the month piece so we've talked about you know do we give people advances up front how would that work from an expenses point of view we're looking at more access to more support vehicles so we are looking at and, and we are obviously we've got some support vehicles out there anyway so we are trying to maximize what we do but any assistance or any any thoughts and have a look we'll have a look at it We've not ruled anything out at this stage, and we'll continue that conversation as we get into the um, into the post the summer and into the autumn, and obviously with the next uh, next hike. While I'm on that, there is a section in, in I see to put about the pay award. Obviously, the pay award has come out. It's a bit more complicated than it normally is. Um, uh, it is funded, um, so obviously we're working through that, and that being September salaries. Um, but we are expecting some, some feedback from the unions in relationship to that. But we'll, we'll, I'm sure Steve will pick that up under his, his section. Um, the BAF statements are in there, going back to my report. That was something I wanted to do about how we connect some of the statements from the objectives of the, the committees and the fact the non-execs particularly, alongside the execs, because they're, they're in there. And I know there's been quite a lot of background work done for that. Um, I've mentioned the place leads in the report. There is just an update on that. It literally came in yesterday, and that's the whole. Um, it says Hull Interim America Daily Oak has been appointed full time to that post now. Um, so I've sent her our congratulations from an organisational point of view. Um, we're still awaiting the York one. Uh, so I've obviously sent everybody congratulations as you would expect, but we're just waiting for the York post. Um, it's great to see some of the pictures of the Humber Centre gym. 
We've been waiting for that for a long time. So if you remember a while ago, we committed capital capital to improve some of the Humber Centre and some pictures in the in the report there. I don't know if Ian wants to pick that up. Lots of information on comms. We've been doing a lot more work on the Recruitment Unbelievable campaign and the NHS birthday where we give everybody a cup, uh, two pounds to have a cup of tea and a cake with us all. Um, and lots of service pressures continue. Um, we've still got, as, as the chair related to at the beginning, increasing COVID. We've had a couple of outbreaks on our wards. Um, so there is still a lot of pressure in the system uh, across the health system. We're actually quite reasonable in, in our um, our response levels, our OPAL levels, we're between two and three, but that doesn't mean we're not under pressure across the organisation. But the system remains in pressure from the ambulance service, particularly all the way through, as I say, primary care in, into community and mental health services. But I'm sure Lynn will pick that up. We are reviewing our plans for winter. We've got plans already. We'll continue to review those. We're watching Australia, particularly with their flu season. And we've got our draft plans now, which will be back to the board in September, um, our COVID vaccination programme for, for the autumn and our flu vaccination programme as well. I'll pause there, Chair, and I'll, I'll throw it over to my colleagues if they want to pick anything else up. And obviously, I'll throw it open to questions. Thanks very much, Michelle. Any other members of the EMT would like to speak to anything in the report that affects them or they're responsible for? No. OK, let's open it up to questions. Uh, Stuart, please. Yeah, thanks very much for a very uh, full, um, interesting report as usual. It's a contemporary question. What did we learn and observe in the heat wave? What a really great question. Good actually, question. Our staff, uh, our staff did absolutely fantastic in the heat wave. Um, as always, they absolutely um, came to fruition. And actually, we got through it really, really, really well. Um, obviously, we've got lots of air conditioning coolers, etc. And obviously, we've got water coolers. But we didn't experience too many pressures or an increased sickness level. But I'll pass over to Lynn because she'll give you uh, the more the, the, the more details on that. So good morning, Lynn. Yes, thank you. Good question, um, Stuart. So um, yet another example where we've been able to test one of our emergency plans, this time our heat wave plan. So um, just to reassure you as well, after every time that we step up our command arrangements, which we did on the Friday before the expected heat wave on the Monday and the Tuesday, we are now doing a um, debrief exercise to identify what we can learn, make sure that, you know, if there is any way in which we can improve our heat wave plan specifically, then we will do that. We do that across the system as well, Stuart. So um, I think overall, as Michelle says, our plan worked well. Um, one of the areas that we are going to look at is whether we need to do anything more um, mechanically and with our estates team around um, cold areas within our inpatient wards, um, anticipating that unfortunately um, this might be a more frequent event going forward that we just really want to make sure that we are as prepared as we can be. But we did, for example, install integrated water coolers um, 18 months ago as part of our COVID response actually to keep our patients hydrated and our staff particularly in wearing PPE. So it's great that we had that access to hydration, hydration obviously being an area of focus to um, mitigate the impacts of the heat. So I think overall we did really well but I can absolutely assure you we will be doing a full debrief um, as we would anyway and any time occasion we uh, instigate a plan. Yeah, brilliant. That's really good to hear. It's worth uh, doing more, just double, triple checking the uh, security of any, what would, you, what would you do if the power went off? But that's good to hear. And I understand ice cream sales rocketed as well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Stuart. Um, Francis. Thanks, Chair. A couple of points. First one was on the broad assurance framework. So really good to have the, the new statements that we've got on each of the strategic goals. Reading through them, I, I just wondered if on the strategic goal 2-1, uh, we also should have something in there. Obviously, the enhancing prevention and well-being will also um, stop over overstretched services being stretched further. Just wondered if that might be one of the things that we put in there. And on goal five, <clears throat> I've noticed throughout the, the, the all the papers, we seem to be mixing up maximising and optimising. So we just need to make sure it's optimising consistently throughout the whole paper. 
Um, the other thing I then wanted to pick up on was the early implementer site evaluation work, which looks really good, some, some great work there. And the question really was is, with all of that going on, what do we think the impact is going to be long term? The so what question. So, so it's great, looks really good. What's the impact and, and how will it uh, impact on us as a, as a trust? Thanks, Francis. Some great questions. Obviously, um, I'll take your point about the the, optim the optimising, and we will look at that uh, again. It's a really good, really good point. Now we'll think about the wording, and we'll, and we'll bring that. Well, we will include it and bring it back to the the board in September. But I've asked over to Lynn about the early because it is really positive news, and it should have some really positive and maximum benefits going forward. But I'll pass back over to Lynn for that. Is that okay, Lynn? Yeah, thank you. Can I just check people can hear me? Okay, so I'm having some connection problems. Yeah, you're 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 throaty, gravelly voice, but you're right. fine. Okay, I can't change that at the minute, but thank you. Um, yeah, as Francis, obviously we were one of the twelve national early implementer sites for this CMHT transformation. So, and as you say, the full report actually will be going to um, the quality committee in due course as well, and it is very positive overall. And the fact that I think we did this, unfortunately, um, amidst a pandemic as well. And you'll probably remember it did enhance our overall staffing for um, the primary care mental health sites by around 80 staff. And we were really successful overall in the recruitment of those staff as well, which was great. I think in terms of longevity, um, the key sort of ambition was really to make a step change in mental health provision in the fact that it's situated and cited in primary care. So really should, you know, um, augment the um, prevention early intervention agenda significantly. So I guess in terms of one of the sort of key elements that we're looking at as well is, well, what has that meant to um, onward referrals, for example, to um, secondary community mental health services? Because if service is working really well in primary care, it really should be having a step change in respect to providing that early support and therefore negating the need for um, onward referral um, in, in the volumes that we were seeing. And don't forget, before the pandemic, um, this intervention was in recognition that the um, community mental health teams were under significant pressure even before the pandemic around just, you know, volume of referrals uh, and needs. So, and I think we are seeing the early signs of some of that coming to fruition as well. There's more work to do. Um, but um, that step change that I think we all hope to see. Um, so I think over the coming sort of couple of years, um, um, part of our data obviously is really to focus on that, not just in terms of um, numbers of referrals, but obviously the um, the outcomes. So there is um, health outcome measures that are being used as part of this. We'll be able to report more data around what they're finding going forward um, as well, as well as the patient experience um, and part of this as well, that having um, access to mainstream mental health support within primary care in a way that hasn't been um, able to be provided before, um, we, we expect to make that a big, you know, big difference in terms of people experience um, of that as well so more work to do undoubtedly but I guess those are for me sort of the key findings that we're focusing on in terms of the future. Thanks Lynn. Thanks Lynn. Uh, Dean. Yeah, Dean you're thank, on mute. That's it. Thanks Michelle it was just a, um, a catch up on the funding of the pay award I, I, in the paper it talked about if it was more than three percent it's it's not funded and services being caught but I think you said I may have misheard you that it's been confirmed it's funded is that is that correct? It, it, it is yeah I mean we've got Ian on the call but yes it is a bit obviously it's been funded from the NHS the, the total NHS in budget so obviously that we wait to see what effect that will have going forward in relationship to some of the uh, the areas of investment uh, so we don't know what that means yet um, and there is an issue potentially about ongoing funding of, of, of the pay award but we'll, we'll we'll cover that next year as it were but that's correct isn't it Ian? there's been no further yeah. update on that no no further I mean we wait and see Dean some of the detail around that um, because not all the categories mm. of the uh, agenda for change have been have come out we're just working through it all uh, and obviously we'll be in close contact with our ICB colleagues because there'll be a lot of conversation around that um, and I think it's from a national point that Julie and Kelly is you know you know out there trying to trying to ensure that that what whatever increase over and above the three percent that they're given is funded but again as just as Michelle says that that's 
we, we just got to wait confirmation on that. But just to reassure you that we're working through it on a line by line basis for, for the trust. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, um, Dean. Philip. Yeah, Lynn, it was just, just really to reiterate how much I welcome the CMHT being uh, working in, in primary care. It's 20 years ago since that last was, and it was one of my biggest regrets in my career, because when you feel supported and empowered, um, you, you, you go a lot further in, in holding on to patients, and the patients really like it because they know who's looking after them. Uh, and it's one of the biggest mistakes that we've made in recent years is that mental health and, and general practice have gone their separate ways. These are one people, it's a holistic care. So I can't tell you how much I welcome that. And I'm sure the outcomes are going to be great. Brilliant. Fantastic to hear that from you, um, Philip, with your background and experience. So, um, so thank you. It'd be great to catch up with you outside of the board about this programme too. Great. Thank really exciting. Thanks, and, Philip. As you said, Philip, really well well needed, overdue, a lot overdue. So we're really excited about it. Being a national site is really great as well. But yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Can, can I, I can't see anybody hands up. Can I just ask for a quick bit of clarification on the new training requirement for all staff who support people with a learning disability and, and autistic people that's coming in? It's on uh, page 40 of the pack and I think page 15 or 23 of the report. It mentions there about the requirement to be trained in autism in the uh, in, in our autism strategy. Do I presume from that we've already got an established training programme in terms of people working with people with dis learning disabilities? Yeah, we have this. This is just an brilliant. Week. OK, I just wanted to make I just wanted to clarify that that was, um, you know, yeah. in the, you know, that was reflected that we are already doing it, obviously, yeah. for uh, people with learning disabilities. But we're developing that area. Thanks. That's really helpful. Uh, thanks for that clarification. Anybody else? OK, thank you very much. Now, we are, are to ratify. Um, the uh, policy that has been agreed by the EMT um, uh, is well, well, is everyone happy with ratifying that? I suppose, yeah. And that's the policy on digital clinical safety policy. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So we move on now to the publications and highlights report. Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Again, it's just here for information. These are the major documents that have come out. We've got you do obviously bring information of the learning disability piece and the CQC. Obviously, all this will go through the quality committee anyway. We obviously CQC is going through massive changes, we know, in relationship not just to its structure work into a, an MDT point of view, but obviously now going to be accountable to re, um, regulate systems, but also changing the CLOEs. Um, and I do I, I know the quality committee will be will be really assessing that and our response to that. So that's there. For Further update from the CQC, which has been regular, um, and, and the other ones are included in the paper and the relevant director's response. Um, so I shall I shall leave it there, Chair, unless there's any questions. Michelle, any questions? Mike. Thanks, Michelle. Um, just on page 53 of the pack, um, I'm a bit confused. The, the same paragraph in blue, the trust has, has not been approached to be an early adapter. If we are not approached, the new single assessment framework will apply. Can we approach them? I've already done it. I've already had a few <laughs> conversations with them. I mean, they don't know actually who is going to be an early adopter until August. I think they're, they're trying to sort out their management structure first, or the, the mid-management structure, and then, because obviously they're working through the inspectors, because some inspectors will be completely based at home and just do um, documentation and virtual type assessments, and then the other assessors will be out and about. Um, but I have expressed an interest on being an early adopter site, but we won't know until August. Thanks for that update, um, Michelle. Thanks for the question, Mike. Anybody else? No, thank you very much. That's uh, received a note. We move on to the performance report. We've got Ian with us, I think, and, and Lynn are going to do this double act today, I think. Uh, yeah, thanks, Caroline. And, and can I just say thanks for the opportunity to present today? I do appreciate that. I'm obviously subbing for Pete, but, you know, hopefully I'll do him justice. Um, so just in terms of the uh, performance report, if I can just sort of introduce it really, uh, and 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 really the, the the narrative that's in the key issues is, is is probably very relevant. But just in terms of the report itself, we have included the harm-free incidents that were being requested by the board, and that's in the the, the relevant table. So hopefully 
you, you'll be aware of that and see that that's a new thing. You'll also see that um, we've got a, quite a bit of detail on waiting times, and there's a comparison between the quarter four of last year and the quarter one waiting times this time. And also, I think for the first time, we've got QOF, which relates to our primary care sites, which is something we do, you know, really keep a, a close eye on. And I know I do in, in the role that I've got on Humber Primary Care as well. Um, and, and then we are expecting the 22-23 performance uh, in the start of that in September. So, so there's quite a bit of detailed narrative behind that as well. But just in terms of sort of the headlines that I just flag up, um, we, we, we have got some sort of matters of concern around the, the fill rates in the five wards that are below the target. There's detail of that. However, our care homes per hour per patient day uh, remain above the threshold for all wards except Moulton. But I think what there is is some particular bed occupancy issues there with it being high. Sickness does remain a concern, but clinical leads have been tasked with reviewing the detailed factors behind that. Um, one of the sort of very strong things is performances regarding uh, on training uh, and note that, that all those issues go to the workforce and OD and, and particularly the, the, the detail on the nine courses a bit below the target have been provided with an update. Um, and just also flagging that um, clinical supervision is, is above the revised target. So, so they're the real sort of um, quick highlight things that, that I'd like to just flag up uh, and then just really open it up for, um, you know, uh, any any uh, questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Lynn, did you want to add anything? Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, yes. Ian. Thank you, Chair. Yes. So this month, um, as has already been noted, um, you've got the additional um, supplementary information specifically in relation to waiting times of those targets that are challenged um, at the moment. I guess just by way of context, um, as we have been having these conversations here over um, recent months, um, the um, ongoing position around um, demand um, obviously continues to be sustained. We still are seeing that month on month um, increase in demand. Um, I hope what you can see from the um, detail in the additional information is there is detailed capacity and demand modelling work taking place in all of those areas that are challenged in terms of um, having sufficient capacity to meet the demand on an ongoing basis. So that has led, as you can see, to um, trajectories that are in place. So trajectories are reviewed on a very regular basis. We have had some challenges around some of those areas. I've been reporting those here um, for some while. So, for example, children's autism spectrum diagnosis, where we're using our own in-house service, but supplementing that with um, independent sector resource as well. We've had a couple of challenges um, around the contractual um, um, elements of that. We have resolved those now um, and actually we're really encouraged with our um, already obviously monitoring very closely our July data position on that. So it does, I can assure you, perhaps not in this June data that we've got here today, but encouraging to see that what we expected to see delivered by way of additional capacity um, looks like it is on track, which is great. We have been a little bit cautious given our experience. So, um, so that gives us confidence that that um, ASD trajectory, we may well um, be in a position hopefully to even revise that further to expedite the um, rate of improvement. We've had some challenges around memory assessment service as well, particularly in terms of um, making sure that we've got additional um, medical um, diagnostic capacity in place. Uh, we're now confident we have made an appointment to that post. So again, over the next coming months, we should see that um, have a desired impact on the trajectory um, there as well. we have got some other challenged areas in terms of um, early intervention service in psychosis. We have recruited additional staff now to those services and they're coming on stream in August and September. So again, pretty confident around the trajectory that we've got in place there um, as well. 
So um, um, I guess just to, to reassure the board, um, this is one of our biggest operational pressures. It remains so. It's also our biggest operational priority um, to make sure that we are doing absolutely everything that we can to optimise the staffing, the resource um, that we can to um, reduce these waiting times as quickly um, as possible. We're really happy to take any questions. I can see hands are up already. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, let me just bring Hilary in, uh, who might want to add something on, on, on the report and then bring in questions from colleagues. Hilary. Thanks, Caroline. Yes, just from, from the areas that I'm responsible for, um, the incidents um, chart in there that you can see, quarter one, you can see there there's a, a general uplift in the number of incidents reported. Um, that is just generally down to right across the board, really, more acuity, complexity, um, generally, there's two inpatient units that's driving that. There's a full detailed report of the incidents in quarter one for the quality committee next week. It's in the, the insight report. Um, I think that the, the main messages from it, though, are that 97.7% uh, across quarter one is low or no harm. So the higher incident reporting is good. It's a positive culture that staff are reporting incidents of low and no harm. We've also got increased reporting of near misses, which is really positive as well. Self-harm is the highest category, and I say there's two units that, that are, are really driving uh, the, the uh, acuity there. Also, North Yorkshire Community Services, as well as higher reporting in there for quarter one. And again, that's again, I think, just discharging from the acute, um, perhaps earlier than, than normal due to pressures in the acute, and they're picking things up as well. But it's actually positive that we're getting the, the, the high reporting uh, and instance of low and no harm. Just wanted to pick up again about the clinical supervision. I know Ian mentioned it, but we, we increased the um, compliance rate from 80 to 85 percent. And we've had the most fantastic response, you know, with all this, this backdrop of sickness and everything at 91.2 percent. We've never achieved that compliance. I think it's about five teams out of 124 that that failed to report in the compliance or it was just below that. So we, we, we keep an eye on that. But that's been fantastic uh, response from our team because it's so important is that clinical supervision piece. Just onto the safer staffing dashboard, um, the sickness, we've got 16 flagging red this month. If we go back to last year, when we were sort of in the thick of the pandemic, uh, there were 10. Uh, I fed this back, we discussed it at the Workforce Committee, committee um, and the re response back from all of the divisions, I've asked them all to look at the, the, the sickness, is it is being driven by increased COVID. Um, obviously, our staff now, like the rest of the community, are out there. Nobody's wearing masks, no social distancing, so they're picking COVID up, which a year ago they didn't because we'd got lockdowns, social distancing, etc. So it is that that's driving it. But we're, we're keeping on top of it. It's... Um, because they can come back after six days, providing they've had their negative um, LFT, it, it seems to be that a staff are coming back, you know, maybe others are then going off sick. So we're managing to keep a control on it. But Lynn and I look at it every day and we've got a trigger of when we might you know, need to take further action um, to, to try and control that. But that is generally what is causing this, this problem. But as you can see from the dashboard, despite the sickness, we've still got really good um, results there in terms of that end column. None of the units are flagging uh, red, so that would mean that five indicators uh, are red for them to, to flag red on that. Clinical supervision, a couple of units there um, that are flagging red. Pan view now is 97%. We just got the uh, latest clinical supervision in this uh, earlier this week for them. Swale um, has actually gone down a little bit this month, so I'm, I'm on to the matron with that to try and see what we can do to get that back up to where it needs to be. It's sickness, it's leave, it's acuity, and it's staff covering other wards that has caused that, that problem there. BLS is a, is a concern. Um, you can see there there's some reds on the basic life support. We've started the new um, resource trainer. They started on the 11th of July. They are targeting um, the inpatient units and they've got a couple of sessions already booked at Whitby Hospital, which is very concerning there at 30%. So they, I think they're there next week and the week after. So we should start to see that, that go up as well. Um, I think that's mainly my points from, from the performance report. Thank you. Thanks, Hilary. OK, thanks for that. And to Lynn as well. Let's go to questions, comments. Francis. Thanks, Chair. And, and Hilary's addressed two of mine on, on the incidents and sickness. So very thorough. Thanks. So my, my other two were both on waiting list. I think the report Lynn's provided is excellent, gives a huge amount of detail, which is great. 
I was just going to pick up on two areas. One was RTT. So, so I understand what you're saying about um, as you concentrate on incomplete, complete will start to worsen. But just looking at it at the moment, complete is worsening and incomplete isn't really changing dramatically. I just wondered how bad is complete likely to get while we focus on incomplete and when would that turn around? And then the second question was on the, um, in, in terms of children's autism, et cetera, and, and your talk on pack page 99 um, about the fact that um, detailed contracts have been drawn up with providers to penalise against non-delivery contract meetings, which is great. I just wondered around the quality assurance around uh, contractors and how we maintain that quality assurance. So just those two, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. On the complete and incomplete um, position, obviously France is the biggest waiting list impacts mostly on both of those charts, so it's children's ASD. So um, with the delivery that we have um, now believe that we've got in place, and as I say, the July data is very encouraging, then that should mitigate the risk on that. So hopefully next month when I'll be able to report the July data, it really will give us that confidence. Also that we know France is one of our um, new contractors is potentially offering us even more capacity um, as well. But probably you can understand our caution a little bit given um, recent months. So we just want to make sure that we're getting the um, absolute sort of minimum that we've contracted for. If that's delivered, and then we're actually going to look very quickly at increasing the um, capacity further. So it will be able to report that next time. But as you quite rightly say, and it is connected to that, we absolutely want to make sure that the quality of those um, interventions are where we want them to be as well, given that it is a new provider that we're working with. So internally, we have measures in place, safeguards in place, as you would expect, with our own senior clinical staff overseeing the quality assurance aspects um, of the delivery of, of these contracts. So um, I think we're right to caution the um, expected sort of impact, but... I'm hoping as well that we've got, you know, more that we can bring to the table to mitigate that as well and um, with the plans that we've got in place. So I hope that answers both of your questions, sir. Thanks, Lynn. Happy with that, Francis. OK, uh, Stuart. Uh, thanks very much. Um, great report as ever, very, uh, very packed with data. And I think we've said on several occasions, you know, if you step back from the data and look at the pattern here, our key challenges are about capacity building, capacity optimization, and, and kind of, you know, dealing with that kind of wall of referrals coming through. Um, and um, by the way, like Francis, I found the report on the detailed action being taken in each area about managing the waiting list very, very, it gave me a great source of assurance because it felt very, uh, very uh, detailed and precise. However, the, gra the graph on referrals going up and up and up is at kind of aggregated level. And my question is, I've got two questions. My first one is, in relation to that graph, do we understand its composition and the drivers behind the composition? Uh, question number one, you're nodding already, Lynn, so that's a positive. <laughs> uh, and the second question is that one of the graphs that's going in, you know, some of these graphs are going, you know, doggedly in the wrong direction for us, but the one of on out of area placements on them. Um, Pack page 82. It's going to, you see the, tr the trend going down quite, you know, towards our kind of lower target limit, which is really encouraging. And I wondered in relation to that graph, is there a kind of um, a general set of observations you can make about how you've managed to turn that piece of performance from above target in the, about a year ago to, you know, well within tolerance now? Thanks, Thanks. Stuart. Um, so just, just to assure you then, Stuart, on your first question, yes, obviously we're seeing this at aggregated level, but obviously we see this at um, team and indeed service level. So we absolutely know where this um, trend is impacting particular individual services, where we are seeing that real true rise in demand. Um, if I were to, to, to tell you sort of where one of our key hotspots Oh, it's the one that we've been reporting for a while. It is children and adolescent mental health services, where we are seeing that rising demand, um, both in terms of the neurodiversity services, unfortunately, and there is a correlation between that and COVID and what happened with schools and education through that period on the back of a pre-existing um, challenge and pressurised area anyway, particularly in Hull. 
Um, but we are seeing that rise across core CAMs as well. Um, COVID, unfortunately, has had nationally a very adverse impact on children and young people. In terms of what we're doing about that, obviously, that isn't just an issue, as we've been describing here, for the trust. That's a systemic issue across our systems. And Michelle will know it's one of the key focuses in the Mental Health and LD collaborative programme that she leads as well. She and I were talking about it yesterday as we talk about it quite frequently, about where we need to augment pathways um, in response to that. We've seen a rise as well in referrals from schools, for example, particularly in terms of neurodiversity. We're working with the education system. I met last week with one of the senior SENCOs, for example, who coordinates um, SENCO resources across Hull to look at what more that we do to um, support schools and education preventatively, make sure that they've got the right support in schools so that we're not just seeing that result in um, referrals when we could actually prevent that with the right support. So there's a huge amount of work, Stuart, right across the systems and um, to, to really focus on these areas. So we're not just looking at the numbers and actually not just looking at what we can do. I mean, we're, we're part of it, but we do need to look at that systemically. Can I just put in there, Chair? Can I just put, yeah. Obviously, I think that, that there's, there's two bits. Yes, there's a lot of work nationally going on as well, as well as locally for, for children and young people, particularly, and not just around um, mental uh, well-being, et cetera, but about eating disorders as well, because that's causing us some massive issues um, at the younger end and all the way through, actually, in disordered eating. So actually, at the moment, that's probably growing as a more... Um, acute concern across across the patch and certainly within the organisation and, and we're looking at community solutions to that in the main. But going back to your point, one of the major effects of the reduced reduction in out of areas, obviously I monitor it on a system basis, not just for um, Humber and North Yorkshire, but actually from a Yorkshire and Humber point of view. One of the, certainly from our point of view, which isn't mirrored in other trusts, which, uh, which is interesting, we have got a good flow. We've always had a really good system flow because actually we've got a fairly reduced number of beds, which is great. Um, across the organisation, and we've always been commended. So actually, before COVID, we were we were before and we were an exemplar site in relationship to our benchmark. We're still there, but obviously COVID's affected all that in relationship to capacity. Um, but our our throughput, our readmission rates are lower, etc. So all the clinical indicators are good as well. But one of the main effects, uh, I think, for out of area placements, not just here in other areas, was the COVID restrictions because we had to reduce our capacity even more. So if you put a graph underneath, you'll probably see some alignment between the reduction in bed capacity and the out-of-area placements. Um, and when we looked at ours, it was really, and if you remember, we did a lot of work at Maester because we were getting increasing referrals from our older personal units. So we actually put some more bed capacity in there as well, which has also offset it. So I think it's a really, really um, systemic, but, but really focused area from a trust point of view that we've managed to, to do that. And we need to sustain it, obviously, because that's the important piece is sustaining it. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks very much. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Philip. Yeah, th thanks very much. I, I love data, so that's great. Um, um, before I got get too much and learn the detail about pathways, I was trying to look at this from the filter of what are the big system issues, and obviously workforce is one of them, particularly staff turnover and sickness. But the thing I'd just like to ask a question about is, is the referrals which have doubled in the last two years, and uh, we can improve our pathways no end, but if, if you keep pouring more people in uh, at the top, that's going to be really difficult. Um, and I, I just wondered if there's any work being done maybe with the Integrated Care Board, because um, we've got a situation where, in, in my world, we, we've seen patients more remote. Um, we used to think very carefully about referrals, but it, it's becoming more and more just of an administrative process. Somebody just sends us a note to do something. And, and really, if the systems go into... Um, cope uh, and provide excellent quality of care um some somebody really needs to look urgently at, at referral rates in general um you know at it at its worst it doesn't touch the side you just pass it on and that we would never 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 like that that is not we you know we took our as gps took our gatekeeper role very seriously uh, and that's broken down during covid and i just just wondered what people's thoughts were about a doubling of referrals. Thanks I mean, for I'm, that, I'm, Philip. I'm Thanks for that. 
So yeah, I'm happy to take a bit of that from a system point of view, but I'm happy to take it offline as well, Philip, because I do think there's a lot more work that we need to do in relationship to the primary care demand, but also the retention issues and the recruitment issues, and certainly some of our, our areas in, uh, in the organisation as well. Um, just going back very briefly to you, because I said we'll have a conversation offline. The the, the, the RCB and intuitive care board is, is very new. I mean, it was obviously legally established in the 1st of July, so it had its set-up meeting then, and it's had one meeting since. So suffice to say, it's just finding its feet in relationship to um, your priorities, work plans, etc., um, and that will obviously continue um, over the next couple of months, and it has to do a strategic document by the end of the year. But um, so it is, it is on, it is on the, it is on the, the the list of things in relationship to demand. One of the things the integrated care board is, and I think it's absolutely right, is doing things differently. We have to do things differently. We've got to do it pretty quickly differently because we're going into winter. And actually, when we look at the system, which is what I alluded to in my report, it's under massive pressure already, and this is July. Um, so what is it going to be going into in, into winter? And that obviously includes everybody from ambulance services to GPs, etc. Um, one of the things that we need to maximise on is because we're quite unusual, and I think it's quite innovative that we've got a primary care collaborative that should build on some of the PCNs. Because if I say some of the PCNs are more established than others across the patch, and I'm not going to that here, but the primary care collaborative was set up. Um, and we're just working through the detail of those um, designs at the moment. We've got more functioning ones than others because of the, just because of the, the length of time they've been in train. But that that provider collaborative will start to look at referral rates, how we can maximise our primary care capacity, how we can minimise some of the, the, the capacity as well. Because you know, I firmly believe if we get primary care right, it's, it affects the whole system. Um, so, so that's that's where the conversations start. But there's lots of stuff going on, and you'd be really helpful actually in that, Philip, if you don't mind. So I'll pick it up online, and we can have some more conversations if that's okay. Delighted, yeah. I think it's really interesting that area because I know from previous discussions I've had with Lynn, you know, one of the issues around referrals and actually how many of those who actually finally get to pass the assessment stage doesn't necessarily always match what they think they need as opposed to where the support could be provided elsewhere, maybe down the road, it would be quite interesting to reflect on what's the rate of referrals from different groups, whether that's GPs or, or SENCOs, and whether there's some examples of really good SENCOs in schools that set, uh, I know you've read, you've talked to me about this before, Lynn, whether there's a, a better practice or understanding that we can get more shared across the different referral routes um but yeah i think it's massively important in all of this and of course just to remind everybody uh, and lynn has said this many times before it you know nobody's happy about the length of time anybody's waiting to have their actual assessment but that does not mean there's not engagement happening with the individuals and their families whilst that is going on i'm not saying that's the you know necessarily you know what you know the answer but it's part of making sure that people don't feel they're just waiting without any contact that's right isn't it lynn no that's very correct caroline thank you for raising that point so particularly children on any of our waiting list call cams um neurodevelopmental there is um protocols in place that ensure that we are in regular contact with those children the clock stops in terms of um autism and adhd at diagnosis so there can be actually be a lot of interventions leading up to the point where you actually complete a diagnosis. So that's a really good point. And across all of our waiting lists, wherever they exist in the trust, um, there is um, protocols in place, which mean that there is you know, regular contact, ideally on a weekly basis, checking in with those individuals. Obviously, if their needs are escalating in that period of time as well, then we would escalate our response um, in, in accordance with that. So, so yes, um, a, a lot of work to make sure that contact takes place. Okay, thank you. Mike? <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, could I just uh, ask a, a side question? What's a SENCO? Is it special educational needs? Ordinary, special yeah. educational needs coordinator, Mike. I'm really sorry. I should have said that. No, 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 no that's, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so, um, on the waiting lists, really, really appreciative of the briefing. Philip likes the data. I like the story. And the story that this tells me is that this trust really, really owns its waiting lists, um, but it sits in a context. And within that context, we've got uh, early intervention in psychology, commissioning terms have been reviewed and resolved. So there's a commissioning issue sitting in the background there. 
phase two of the contract will commence for something in September. Delivery models have to be agreed. We've got the doubling of referrals. So even though we own the problem, the problem is driven sometimes elsewhere. So if the waiting list fairy was to come down and say you've got three wishes outside the organisation to cure this waiting list programme, what would they be? Lynn. Very good question, Mike. You are testing me today. <laughs> um, I would go back first and foremost to the area that I've probably talked to most about, which is children and young people and a systemic change, quite frankly. So to make sure that all of those children and young families, particularly in their very early years, get that support at that point in time in a way that's accessible to them, whether that's at school or at home or in other provisions. So quite frankly, we don't see that huge demand that's coming through to secondary mental health services. Now, I know that's you know, that's a big ask, isn't it? But I do think, you know, Holland East Riding particularly need to challenge themselves around making that systemic step change around children and young people, because in terms of impact on health inequalities, that's what's going to make the biggest difference, isn't it? A good early start in life with the support that you need at that point in time. I do think more and more is happening around that. I think that recognition is there. We've talked here, we've got too many investment in Hull in terms of mental health provision through the um, support teams that are going into schools. We're in 30 schools right now. The plan is to expand that. So I think there's reason to be optimistic, Mike, but that would be my first priority. Great, Mike, thank you. Um, there's no money hands up. I just wanted to ask a quick question just for clarification on the QOF performance uh, Appendix B. I mean, it may not, it may, they may be all high, so it may, be, may not be as pertinent as I might think, but Prince's Medical Centre, uh, Field House, and maybe Peeler House, in terms of their quality outcomes framework achievement, they're all you know, uh, something like, you know, 10% or more below everybody else. Is there anything to add to that to explain that? Lynn, can you, can you pick that up? Because obviously it's an ongoing issue um, I mean, with data collection. A lot, some of it's data collection as well, and some of it's a lag in. Lynn? Yeah, um, our, our in intention, obviously, Caroline, is that we maximise the QOF benefit. But as you see, there is a timing issue about when that happens through the year um, as well. So um, so I can assure you that, again, we have lots of mechanisms in place to um, make sure that we're monitoring that very carefully and remedying it where, where we can. So our expectation is it will improve as the year goes on. OK, thank you. I just wanted a bit of clarification on that. Philip? Love QOF, if, any, if I can... <laughs> If I can be of any assistance, obviously, nationally, national average is 95, 96, so 74 is very low. Um, but I, I put in the comments as well, actually, if the trust was wanted to optimise its financial performance, um, we often found when practices were struggling that it was the prevalence that that, that really, uh, really struggled. And I compared some of Prince's medical centres to healthcare first, which is my practice, and, and it's probably a different population, but some of the prevalences... Some of them, for example, um, things that are difficult to diagnose and code, like heart failure, less than a quarter of the prevalence of my own practice, uh, uh, and that all relates to to finance. So it, it might be, I, I don't know what the demographic of Princess Medical Centre is, but uh, uh, but that that's definitely an area that that could be very fruitful for the trust. Thanks for that, Philip. That's really helpful for that insight. Thank you. OK, nobody more. No more hands up. Uh, so thanks, Ian and, and Lena and Hilary for fielding uh, comments and questions there. And uh, we'll move on to the finance report. Thank you, Ian. I think you're on again. I am. Thank you very much. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just sort of take you through um, some of the key points of the report. I mean, it, 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 it the report itself does draw out those those issues, um, but I just want to sort of highlight a few that, that I feel are important. Um, you, we made a comment in there around that the planning process did conclude on the 20th of June, which is, it is late, uh, but that was due to the national issue and also, you know, the, the, the fact that we're doing this as an ICB. So it, it, it did bring some challenges uh, and Michelle's, you know, well aware of those. We were working really, you know, it, 
uh, into the sort of the last knockings to really get to our position, but we did. And um, so we've moved from that um, million pound deficit to now a break even position. Now that's important for us because, you know, that we'll, we'll, you will see that the target uh, that for month three, which we have met, it, it is a deficit, but it'll, going forward, these targets will reflect reflect the, the requirement to break even. And, and it will mean that we have minor monthly services going forward, basically. But I think that's just important, the context for you, for you really. Um, but that said, we have met that, um, and that's been good. And overall, uh, there's just reassurance there that we've, 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 we're able to do that. And it's, it's really coming from a positive position. You'll see in the table at table one, we've got a bit of pressure on income. I mean, some of that is because what we've we've done a technical thing, we've deferred some of that, uh, and that's our COVID income. So we have got that on our balance sheet. We've banked it as such. Um, but also, I mean, there is some some risk in there uh, in terms of um, income. But we're working all the time with our commissioners on that. Um, so that's just um, and and on clinical income we're we're a little bit up on that, which is positive. I mean, and again, another positive thing is that the overall operational divisional spend is well is an underspend at this point. And and there's a bit of detail there that I've gone into on the report. I mean, primary care we've talked about a bit today already um, is is in an overspend position, but um, we. We are really sort of working with that. It's got a recovery plan. Um, and, you know, if I can say one thing that thicker all over that, um, you know, and, and really, you know, you know, really hold us to account on that. Um, so those, that's just the real sort of highlights in that sense. Um, cash is, is, is positive. Um, and at, at, at this point, uh, that point when we've got nearly 32 million in the bank which is really really positive if i could just flag up one minor typo on the table at three it, it that should read that the provider collab's got 3.4 million uh of of that income amount so really that's just just important there um you'll see there and again we always report on agency it's something that um we've always reported on uh, you know we're we're clear on that and we can give splits on that so we're very clear on on where we've got issues and and they primarily are around the consultants um and we're again there's a plan in place with emt to look at really trying to get those to move those to substantive posts and that will make a difference also the the we've just got some information just in the last couple of days regarding agency um but we're 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 looking through that in a detailed way in terms of whether there'll be uh, any pressures on us reducing that. But that is an ICB uh, target, uh, and so we'll look very much with our ICB colleagues on how we're going to on how we're going to deal with that. But it's something that we that I've been tasked to to look at in a lot of detail, and it'll be coming to EMT. I mean, EMT are well well aware of it anyway. But really, that fine tuning and what it means is the ICB and that target will be taking to, to EMT. So that's really the agency spend. Um, and then obviously our better, better payment practice code. I mean, from a from an actual value point of view, we're, we're performing quite well. We know we need to make some improvements regarding our, our numbers and we're working on that with our uh, both internally with our ops colleagues in terms of you know ensuring that they're aware of when they put a, an invoice on hold that that that'll stop the clock as such uh, and there may be good you know there will be good reasons for that so um yeah that's that's probably um quite a bit of a detailed review but um and i know the report's been to 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 think just recently um so happy to take any questions thank you Cheers, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments from colleagues? Uh, Dean. Yeah, I was, I was just going to pick up on I think the two things that Ian uh, just mentioned uh, latterly there. So I, I understand that in terms of the agency spend, the the ten percent reduction in agency across ICS, I think, has gone to all ICSs. Uh, Ian, so everyone will be looking at that that sort of uh, uh, issue. Uh, but it's just also just a point, just about the, um, the you know the better payments uh, process that you picked up at the end. There. I know 
to some extent that can feel like a technical target, can't it? But given the conversations we've been having about uh, sort of cost of living, you know, for a lot of people, the the you know quick payment of expenses by a large organisation is important to our communities, and can see that you're on that. But it's it's sort of acknowledging that beyond the target, there's a potential consequence in terms of cash flow and employment for uh, uh, for others. So good to hear that you you're on that and having a look at what can be done to improve. So thank you for that. Yep. Uh, and we're always conscious of that. Um, we're always conscious of also being responsive to any of those, um, you know, local providers who, who would contact us and we, we would respond to that and react, you know, proportionately. Thanks, Ian. Any other questions to Ian? Francis, did you want to add anything from FIC? Uh, most of what Ian has uh, put on has been picked up a bit later on my report from FIC, okay. so so I can pick it up there if needed. Great, lovely, Michael. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to then, kind of um, um, respond to the question about the spend with regards to consultant um, local agency locums, I think, I think the agency spend. Um, there is a plan in, in place to develop a medical staffing strategy. Um, uh, Claire Jenkinson and uh, Kwame Fofi are uh, kind of involved in that. And, and there's a little group that we're looking to kind of uh, look at that. There was a medical staffing strategy in the past, but I think it needs uh, a bit of a refresh and uh, relook at how we address this uh, issue around the shortage of medical staff and how we need to kind of therefore see if, if there are other options that need to be explored and considered. I think we've been having um, almost a weekly discussion at EMT as to what the options are. And I think pulling that all together into a medical staffing strategy and then kind of uh, addressing this issue is going to be really helpful in the long run. I think we all are aware that there is a severe shortage of medics. Um, there are other initiatives like going abroad to get people in from um, uh, areas who have an excess, hopefully, and and uh, other initiatives like we've been to the Royal College of Psychiatrists conference to see if we can um, uh, kind of um, get any interest, uh, sorry, interest generated for people to come across to our region. That has helped in the past as well. So, so there are a lot of initiatives happening, but I think uh, the, the fact remains that the spend is still quite um, high. And um, from a national point of view, I think, again, uh, it's not, uh, we, are, we are not unique in that, but I think uh, we need to, um, again, now look at how we can address this issue in a more concerted manner. So I thought I'll just give that update if someone had any doubt about it. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Michael. Thank you for that. Steve? Yeah, again, just just a couple of things on agency that that may hopefully will be helpful. Um, on obviously, it's uh, as Dean mentioned with regards to uh, to targets that we that we are being set and the monitoring that we're we we will be scrutinised for. I'm just wondering, Ian, in this report, whether there's the uh, option to show off framework agency spend within that overall target as well, and making sure that we're including our kind of primary care spend within that. So just wonder whether that might be helpful for board to, to, to sort of differentiate between the two as our framework um, is, is quite a, is quite a focus uh, from there. And um, just just a bit of reassurance, I guess, around the around the medic, the, the medical staff. So Ian mentioned, so all of the agency staff that currently work for us have had conversations to see if they will move onto the books, as it were, and, and take up a trust contract. So that's in place. All of the agency staff uh, medics bar one have agreed to move across to the Tempre system, which again helps us with regards to monitoring spend and gives us the opportunity to look at a different contractual arrangement. So, so we've just got one uh, one resisting that, but everybody else is on the system, and that is now our new way of bringing people through. So, uh, just wanted to give you assurance that those conversations are happening, things are in place. Uh, as 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 Dr. Michael mentioned, uh, there's plenty still to do. There's more work that can that can happen along that, but but I wanted to assure you that. Um, that anybody who's working for us on an agency contract is uh, is has had the offer to, to to come and join us on the books, and that will be an open offer. If any of them are dialed into the call now, we will happily sit down and talk about a contract with them. 
Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Steve. I know there is a lot of work there to make sure. I know governors have asked that question again, and I think we've provided assurance that efforts are hugely made to encourage people to come onto the onto the books and and um, and be part of uh, the service in that way. Um, can I just just to flag because I know governors are are obviously have raised this before. I mean, often in these reports. You know, under children's and learning disability and under mental health, it, obviously in the report, it's it's a finance report and it says it's showing an underspend in those two areas. And and I think in the past, um, governors have been concerned about, well, you know, why aren't we using that money to employ more staff for those particular areas? And the, the answer that's come back is that the problem is, is finding the staff to recruit into those positions. I just wondered how we marry that up with within the report, it, it refers to that underspending is supporting staffing in other areas within that division and how that connects together then, just for particularly our governors who might be watching today and understanding that, and they will have, of course, received this report as well. Yeah, we can add, we've always add something in relationship to the report yeah. about that, but a lot of it is just the recruitment that we've talked and we spend a lot of time on how you know, how we can recruit. When you look at our establishment, it has a significant increase over the last few years. With all the initiatives are great and the work that we've been doing, but obviously recruitment continues to be one of our main challenges, which is why obviously it links into the risk register. But we can just maybe put a paragraph. If there is an underspend, it's a really good point. We can maybe explain a bit more detail as to, about, uh, uh, as to why. I, I think that would be helpful. Um, I think for people in the know, it, they understand it, yeah. but I think it, you know, it'd be really, it, it'd be really I, I helpful. Sorry, but I give people the reassurance that it's not because we're just not spending it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's not. It's not. It's not just that. Then one of the things that we try not to do is take a, take a you know from our budget rejection strategy um, at, at clinical services. But it's not just that there with us um, wanting it to be. But we'll we'll try and explain that succinctly. Uh, so Brilliant. it's a good point. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Yeah, just just on that, I think um, so. The North to Nineteen service is a really good example, isn't it? Because of the extra investment that we've put into that service, effectively, what that meant is as soon as it came with us, that's twenty five vacancies. So that looks like we haven't got twenty five, but actually, that's because of our extra investment. There, new roles there, yeah. we're actively recruiting. It, 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 so it's actually a really positive because over time that will that will show and, and and add to an improved service. But we've just in that time lag because we've just taken that contract on and obviously recruiting into those new roles. Yeah. And, and, and sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. It's very difficult virtually, isn't it, that you don't, sorry. Just, sorry. Just, to re, just to reassure the board as well, I've obviously seen the data from the system in relationship to mental health and learning disabilities particularly, I know we're talking about mental health and learning disabilities particularly, and our recruitment figures are significantly better in relationship to both the new initiatives and, as Steve said, where we bring people across, we actually do manage to fill those posts. I'm hoping I'm not speaking too soon, but there is a, 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 a you know, de, clearly demonstrable um, position from our organisation is slightly better than, than others, so that's positive, but we'll, we'll, we'll try and explain that. That's really helpful. Um, Ian? Yeah, just one sort of final point, it's a quick one, but I mean, I think people will understand it as well, is that budgets are managed at that level, so, you know, and, and, and those ops managers do have that flexibility, if you know what I mean, so we we want them to have that flexibility as our budgets are quite dynamic so you will get underspends in certain areas uh and you know and what managers will say is i, I want to you know i'll keep that as an underspend i won't i won't fire it across because i know things are going to change so we do you know we do manage our budgets in a sort of flexible and pretty dynamic you know dynamic way I think that's really helpful. I mean, a part of my sort of, I suppose, role is just to sort of, you know, make sure anyone listening understands exactly what you've just said there. And actually, the big picture is our workforce is growing, but there are challenges within that in terms of recruitment. Um, and that's uh, so that, you know, we're not complacent. And that certainly isn't the case. Uh, Francis. I will come back in now, just to, just to say, I'll pick it up again later on my report, but the, 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 the beauty of the committees is that we discuss it at finance from a finance perspective and, and push for recruitment, and then I'm on the workforce committee under Dean where we discuss it, and then I'm on the quality committee where we discuss the quality impact of that. So, so just for reassurance for anybody who's listening, it's across all three committees from both a financial, a workforce and a quality perspective. And, and we, we have that cross fertilisation across the three committees. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Francis. OK, and um, I can see no other hands up. Uh, so I'm um, happy with that. Uh, Ian, thank you very much for standing in for Pete.
today whilst he's on holiday as well. Appreciate that very much. And we can move on then to the trust, trust, suicide strategy briefing. My, uh, I think this is Michael, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is, Chair. Thank yes. you very much, Chair. Um, this is just to bring the board up to speed with where we are at with regards to this. Uh, from what I gather, uh, when I when I took over, um, uh, it, it, it had been uh, it, it it was being developed, and uh, um, we just wanted to make the trust board aware of where we are currently at. Um, I, I'm at the right at the outset. I want to thank Hillary, Tracy, and uh, Paul. Uh, I think they have been instrumental in kind of actually drafting the the policy. Um, so the consultation process, uh, there was one gap in that, that the uh, medics uh, had not been consulted, um, but that's now happened. And uh, on the 14th of July, uh, we had a presentation and a feedback session with all the medics involved. Um, all the comments that came back have been noted and these have been reviewed and incorporated. Um, one thing to reassure the board is that, yes, this is a, a suicide strategy which we are expected to have as an organization, but all the actions are already happening. Uh, so please don't uh, uh, feel that, oh, there is no strategy, therefore there isn't an action. I'm sure you won't believe that, but uh, I want to reassure the, you that the, most of the actions which have been as in a strategy, as we know, need, these need to be smart. So these are already taking place, work strings are in place. Um, just to kind of set the scene for if, if someone in the public or, or whoever doesn't understand about the NCISH, the National Confidential Inquiry into what used to be called suicide and homicide is now the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Safety in Mental Health. So this is a, an organization that's based in Manchester and I'm sure uh, Michelle has had kind of dealings with that in her previous sat on and she used to manage that uh, service. It's a national initiative and any uh, suicide uh, that happens is actually uh, kind of reported back to them. They collect the information and all the clinicians who are involved in that, are, uh, the main clinician is contacted and we have to fill in a questionnaire that's sent back to them and they will then gather the data. It's, a, it's an ongoing rolling research that happens and then the outcome of that is what could have been different, uh, what could have been done better. And that then forms kind of the basis for suggestions for all the organizations for broad actions to do. So, so um, we have adapted that and that forms the basis for our uh, sort of uh, strategy, as you can appreciate. Um, now the final product is going to go to the quality committee next month and then to the board in September. Uh, first it will go to EMT, of course, um, um, hopefully soon. But uh, what I wanted to uh, again reiterate is that, uh, yes, this is a strategy that's been on, on, on the annual, but it's, it's already there and that the actions are already being done as we speak. Um, thank you, Michael. It's good to have this with us today and, and be updated on, on where we're going. Look forward to seeing the fuller report when it comes back. Mike. Uh, thanks, Dr. Michael. Thanks, Chair. Um, we've we've been um, at the forefront of this, I think, for a number of years in terms of every year when the National Enquiry has come out, we've responded to it and we've tried to learn from it. But, but just looking at this brief report, Dr. Michael, one of the things that seems to be missing is external stakeholders. Um, and there's no mention of consultation, for example, with the police um, or with, for example, the Taxi Drivers Association regarding single journeys to the Humber Bridge. And I just wondered whether that will be included um, in the uh, in the final strategy, the, the stakeholder involvement. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, thanks. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Michael. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for, for that suggestion. I think uh, if you look at the the full document, I think you will see the various stakeholders who have been kind of consulted. But um, I think point taken, if that's not happened, I think that's something we'll, 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 we'll uh, make sure is corrected. Thank you. Dean, and then Hanif. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, likewise, I appreciate the um, the reassurance, uh, Michael, about the um, uh, the fact that this strategy is in development doesn't mean that there isn't anything going on really sort of important that we sort of uh, capture the work that is 
actively going on in this this area. This this is perhaps a minor point, and it might be something more about NHS language than than anything else. But at, at the start of the um, the document, it refers to consultation with medical workforce, and likewise, uh, the next steps it says medical workforce. Um, I know in the NHS we use medical workforce to refer to doctors. I, I presume in this document here we mean clinical workforce, meaning doctors, nurses, AHPs, etc. But I'll just check it if I've got that right. I think I think uh, you, you're right. I think the, the the kind of terminology sometimes can be confusing, Dean. Um, it's it's the um, uh, the medics who who were consulted on this occasion. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that answer your question, Dean? There. So. Yeah, it, it, it was more, about, I mean, it, it certainly makes it clear within the document that sort of general managers, AHP and clinical leads are involved in this. It was just that there was a couple of places where it referred to the, the medical workforce where, um, you know, clearly a key stakeholder group in this, but it, it's that broader issue, isn't it, of um, uh, getting that sort of ownership from all all clinical staff in this? Yes, I think that's 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 what has happened. OK, OK, I'm sure well, hopefully that will be reflected in the fuller document when it comes back. But yeah, thanks for that. Uh, words I mean a lot. Um, uh, OK, um, I think I have Steve next. Yeah, it was just on the on the consultation, really, and and, and so not to not to embarrass Dr. Michael, but uh, it was discussed at the Trust LNC meeting with the BMA, BMA and the reps, and they were really positive to be included <laughs> and to be able to feed into this. And I think it's gone down really well with that, with the group of staff. So. Um, I think well done, Dr. Michael, on that. I think it's got in, it's it's it, it can only enhance what we're trying to do. So uh, I think it was very positively received. Great, thank you for that. Um, I can't see any other hands up. Um, uh, really appreciated. Um, Hanif, the work. Hanif's got his hand oh, up. Oh, sorry, Hanif. Sorry, it's gone off my system here. Sorry about that, Hanif. No, it, it it's sorry. fine. Steve, Steve's really just alluded to the point I was going to raise around that input from uh, the BIM. Um, particularly in view of the early report we had received on, on this area around the higher prevalence of uh, suicide amongst young black Afro-Caribbean men in particular. Um, but I'm assuming that will be picked up in the uh, the, the fuller document. But yes, yeah, Steve's just uh, verified what I was going to say, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Hani. Sorry about that. My view changed then. Sorry about that. Left you out there. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Michael, anything else you'd like to add? We're all pleased to know that this work is progressing and you know, we're getting wide views on, on how, it should, um, how, should, how it should look in the future. Thank you very much, I, uh, Chair. I don't have any, anything uh, else to add, but uh, I'll take back the suggestions and comments and we'll discuss uh, with, with, with the authors and see how we can move this forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we move on to the trust strategy uh, report. And I think we have, I think, do we have, we have John here, don't we? Yeah. Hi, hi Caroline. Is, is Sarah Thanks, with Sarah. you? Is she away? Is Sarah is there as well? She is. Okay. Sarah's come in, yeah. Okay. Well, I just want to just, start, just maybe just start by thanking you and the rest of the team. Um, I know I've been pretty <laughs> challenging about how it reads and how, and I know other Neds as well have asked about, you know, how we can clearly see what we feel we have to achieve and what that, how we will measure what that looks like. And, and there's been quite a lot of discussion in the last month about that. I, I, I looked through the document and I thought actually that had been picked up enormously in, in the version we've got before the board today. So I just want to thank you uh, and your thank colleagues you. for that. And I um, hope that chimes with my other non-executive directors as well. It, it's uh, it's really helpful to look at it now. So thank you for that. Um, John, you. did you want to sort of introduce and, and, and say something or Sarah? Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce. I mean, Sarah's lived and breathed this um, from, <laughs> from the beginning, so she's, she's best placed to present the strategy. But um, I think I just wanted to say that when we began the strategy, we were clear that we wanted the strategy to be owned by the whole organisation and we wanted to achieve this through full engagement with colleagues within the trust, our patients and service users, the carers and our external partners. I think you'll agree that hopefully we've achieved this. Uh, we in great gauge with 482 attendees at a staff event, had meaningful engagement with the PACE Forum and our governors and had quality discussions with ICS colleagues. Um, I, th I think just echoing your words, Caroline, I'd like to thank yourselves as a board for your support, engagement and, and the constructive challenge um, you've given to our team throughout the whole process. 
Um, hopefully this has led to a, um, a strategy that the Trust can be proud of. Um, as I said, I'm going to hand over to to Sarah. Um, she's lived and breathed this from beginning to end, so she, she, she's best placed to talk about the, the processes of developing the strategy, its structure and its content. Thanks, John. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Caroline. So I'm going to talk briefly through the paper that was circulated with the agenda uh, and the process that we went through in developing the strategy. Uh, and I'll then put the current version of the strategy document up on screen and talk a little bit about the structure and, and the content of the document and then finish with, with questions and, and discussion. So the strategy that we're presenting for approval today has been through a long development process. We actually started this back in early summer of 2021 with reviewing the previous strategy and then setting out the timescales for the refresh. And the reason the process has been so long is that we've collaborated, consulted and engaged at every stage of this process with our staff, our governors, our non-exec directors, patients, families, carers, other key external stakeholders to co-produce the strategy. Um, we held two, two rounds of engagement. So the first one that was from July to December 2021 was kind of a blank canvas listening exercise. Um, involving the staff, the PACE groups, the NEDs through a series of engagement sessions. And we kind of put up a series of topics and issues and, and asked people to comment on what was important to them and what they wanted to see in the strategy. Um, we then combined the findings from this exercise with the review of the previous strategy, um, also copious one-to-one -one conversations that we'd had with senior managers, um, and we brought that together into a consultation draft, which we then went out again to, um, in, in consultation uh, shared the draft strategy with people and sought their views on how they thought it was developing. Um, similar audience to the first group, we went around um, PACE again, uh, around staff engagement, but we also held a series of events for external stakeholders to get views on how we were aligning across the system and some of those big external issues that were coming up. Uh, following that, we went uh, through a process of working really, really closely with, with the board to refine the final document. Um, and this has been the last couple of months. We've been looking at the language we use, the ambition that we want to set for the organisation and trying to make sure that the strategy reflects what makes Humber unique. And at the end of this process, I can say with quite a high degree of confidence that this strategy isn't the, part, uh, the partnership and strategy team's document. We haven't written it in a darkened room. It's the whole board strategy and it's the whole organisation strategy. From the outset, it was important to us that the strategy was a, a user-friendly and visually appealing document. So we worked with the design company to produce a consultation draft. Uh, this is not the version that you're seeing today. Uh, we are going to get it redesigned, but I'm sure you've had opportunity to see it in the past. And there are some images from it in, in the paper so you can see the look and feel of the design. Uh, it was really positively received during the consultation process. So people felt that it was accessible. It, it, it felt easy to read. It felt like an attractive document. So we're planning to retain the structure and the look from the consultation, although we'll put some new images and the new, the new text content throughout also. Um, I'll run through the content itself when I put the document up on screen. So I'm going to skip now to, to, to what happens next. Uh, providing the strategy is approved, we're planning to launch it at the annual members meeting on the 6th of October. Uh, we've been working really closely with the comms team on the communications and launch plan um, and they've been incredibly supportive throughout. So we've we've, um, we've we've got a plan in place. We've looked at the stakeholders we want to engage. Uh, we've looked at how we're going to reach out to people. So we've done quite a comprehensive piece of work there. We've also been working on developing a monitoring framework to underpin the strategy. Obviously, we'll need to revisit, re revisit it and refine it once the final text is approved, which is partly why it's not been presented today. Uh, the aim of this piece of work is to provide the assurance that we are delivering against the strategic goals by identifying some key strategic but targeted metrics that really focus attention on the most pressing issues for the trust. Uh, and this has been a really good opportunity for us, uh, alongside the lead execs and, and, and the NEDs, to explore the massive information that sits underneath the strategy, but is too detailed to incorporate into the published document. And also, in some cases, too fast moving to include in a five year strategy. Um, because, for example, we know that some of the specific national targets we're working to are likely to change over that period. Um, so it gives us the opportunity to be a bit more dynamic within the monitoring flame framework. We're also looking at how other enabling strategies underpin and support delivery of the overarching strategy. So, for example, strategies covering people, estate, digital, patient care um, experience and, and our clinical strategy. You bear with me while I play with the technology. Um, I am going to 
share the document on the screen so that we can all look at the, the draft that's been circulated. It's working its way through to you now. It was. <laughs> Sorry, I went through the process of loading and then decided it halfway through it didn't want to play. It's loading slowly. I think there was a question in the chat, so if I just have a little look at that. Let's have a look. Yeah, Hilary, about having a, a, a town photograph. Yeah, I appreciate that. There are going to be other images through the through the document. Um, these were the top three that, um, that that Michelle and Lynette and Pete picked out as, as wanting to include. Um, one of the issues we have with including photographs of towns is that they tend to have people in, um, and then we often don't have permission to use them. But it, the, the the complete selection of photos that goes through the, the the document should be a bit more representative, and we do have some photos of staff that we are, we are able to use. Okay, so I, I've now got the. Um, the presentation up on screen. I hope everyone can see that. Um, and this is this is a mock up of the front cover. Um, images were taken by by Humber staff. We did a, a staff photography competition to, to to source these images, and there are some more that will appear in the full document. We start with a, a chief Executive chair's introduction. Uh, it explains the purpose of the documents and also highlights some of the key themes that sit run through the document. Um, including our, our aspiration to achieve CQC rating of outstanding, uh, our commitment to continuing to develop and support our workforce, the importance of co-producing all aspects of our work with our staff, our patient carers and our communities, uh, and the central role that partnerships with other organisations and communities will play in our future development. At close to the start of the document, we felt it was important to include a, a succinct elevator pitch statement um, it's the bit in bold in blue on, on, the, on the left here, uh, which describes the trust's unique, unique assets and, and USPs. So the themes expressed in this statement around system leadership, co-production, research-driven innovation um, and delivering care are sort of developed and expanded through the strategy document. So you'll see these themes coming through from the introduction into here and then, then into, the, into the meat of it. Uh, the remaining content on this slide gives an overview of the kind of services we deliver. Just to put the rest of the strategy in context for readers who aren't familiar with the trust portfolio. We've got a strategy on a page um, that sets out the trust mission, vision, values, and then how that links into delivery of the strategy. Um, obviously, from this page, this is not the final document. It is going back to the designer. It will be tidied up substantially from this. This is just kind of a mock-up to show you the content in a readable format. We're now getting to the meat of the strategy, which sets out our strategic goals. The, the titles of the goals are largely unchanged from the previous versions, very small wording tweaks, but the detail that sits underneath has changed significantly. Um, we've got a page for each of the goals. They'll have a picture on each page as well when we get into the, the final version, um, but we've split the content into two sections saying how we'll achieve the goal, but also how we'll know we've achieved it. Uh, I appreciate there is a lot of detail on each slide here, um, you've got the document in the papers, and I'm thinking that we'll get into some of the detail perhaps in the, in the discussion section if that will be useful. But just as part of the process, the, the board's had an awful lot of input into developing and refining the content of each goals. Um, we've had multiple meetings with the lead execs, with the NEDs for each goal, and we've also involved other people from across the trust to make sure that we were aligned with other plans and strategies and, and that the language we were using was consistent, for example, when we're talking about recovery or, or trauma-informed care, for example. Um, so the six goals that we have within the strategy are this one, innovating for quality and patient safety, enhancing prevention, well-being and recovery. I sort of think of these two as being goals that are focused around the, the care that the care that we deliver. So that they're kind of I think they group into three sets, really. We've then got a goal around fostering integration, partnerships and alliances, which is how we work largely with the statutory and voluntary sector partners. So that's more about working Formally, formally with other organisations um, and, and about system working and our role as being a leader um, within the the, um, the Humber Coast and Vale Health and Care Partnership. 
And then we've got the flip side of that, which is promoting people, communities and social values, which is how we look at that from a different angle and look at how we really work with our, work with our people, work with our communities, involve the people um, that we that we work with uh, in the services we deliver and how we deliver against our, our anchor mission of supporting and embedding ourselves in our communities. And then the last two sections are more about how we organise ourselves internally um, and I'm saying internally because that's partly about uh, that's, that's partly about us as an organisation, how we, for example, manage our staff and our finances, but also about how we address those issues as part of a system, um, as, as the finance report that you've seen previously is, is also alluded to. So we've got developing an effective empowered workforce and then we've got optimising an efficient and sustainable organisation. Uh, the document ends with a section that describes how the strategy was developed. Um, emphasising the importance of co-production uh, and using a sort of you said we did format, which seems to be quite uh, quite well received usually. And the back page just tidies things up. We, we credit our um, creative and very talented staff who submitted the images from our photo competition. I see we've got, got a late entry in, in, in the chat there. Right, thanks, Caroline. Um, those are the, we haven't got all the images in this version, as I said, but they will be put in the final version. Uh, and, and lastly, we're, we're really pleased that the process of creating the strategy has been awarded the co-production stamp. So the sort of the two way facing heads uh, logo that you'll see there. Uh, and that just really recognises the, the hard work that the team's done to make sure the strategy was truly produced in collaboration with, with the people it impacts. And thank you for listening. So we'll take any any questions and comments, please. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Sarah. Um, any any questions or comments to Sarah or John? Me, uh, uh, Francis. Just, just first of all, well done, Sarah and John. Fantastic, and it looks really, really good. A couple of really, really minor ones. You're talking about uh, working with the uh, the youth action group, uh, so I'm presuming that you'll pick up all the kind of social media stuff that that age group use these days. So none of them read the news on newspapers; they all get it online. So I presume you'll do that. And then just a very minor one, which I presume is because you've used an old image, but the on the plan on the page, it's still got maximising rather than optimising in the uh, in the diagram. <laughs> oh, then, yep. Good point. We'll pick that up. Uh, and yes, we are we are working with the, the Youth Action Group exactly on some of the social media uh, strategy um, and also getting them involved in, in, in the video that we're creating to promote the strategy. You're going to have to go on TikTok, Sarah, if that's still if that's still a trend. I might be even be behind the curve on that. Who knows? Um, uh, Dee, uh, Steve and then Dean. Yeah, you've kind of uh, left me with a vision of Francis doing a TikTok now, uh, Caroline, before I was uh, <laughs> asked. Look, I, it was just for me just to just to say thank you to both Sarah and John. And I just echo everything they've done. It feels really inclusive. It feels like we've cons consulted well, listened to people and lots of views and they've brought that together in a in a really coherent way so just from my point of view uh, i'd just like to pass on my thanks to the work that they've done on this um thanks very much uh steve and i've got stuart oh did yep. i have dean sorry dean did i have you dean you do thank you sorry <laughs> and then stuart thanks caroline i just um uh, wanted to thank the executive team as well. I mean, um, as, as the paper says, that this is uh, a work that's continued over the last uh, couple of years during COVID when there's been enormous demands on people, hasn't there, in terms of operational pressures, and it would have been easy uh, to stop work on this, but it's uh, it's great that the executive team as a whole has meant that we have been able to keep progressing this work, you know, with an eye to the future and not just the the pressures of here and now. So, um, so thank you for that. And then uh, likewise, I agree with... Uh, uh, with John about Sarah just having lived, lived and breathed this and uh, there has been plenty of opportunities uh, Sarah for us to sort of get engaged with this you've talked about the stuff with staff but just really appreciated the the one-to-ones the, the timeout sessions that we've had that ability to kick the tires on it to have a look about whether reflecting all our services whether it's in primary care or mental health and community in the different places so it's been it's been great to do that so uh, uh, good good and I'm, I'm i'm no doubt that you'd be very relieved to get to this point today so uh, so well done to you and team as well uh thanks dean stewart yeah thank you um <clears throat> yeah sarah and jonathan uh, a gargantuan effort and it must be awful to try, try and write something by committee in which you no know, i put some really really picky points in the chat about style i by the way, in a previous life, I also used to be a proofreader, which is an occupational hazard. 
um, a more substantive point about presentation. It's the use of the word sustainability, which on uh, on the section on the efficient organisation is used to refer to financial sustainability. I think almost universally now the word sustainability means more than financial sustainability. It's about you know the um, you know the UN strategic de uh, sustainable development goals kind of thing. So just just. That, I think that is a substantive issue rather than a stylistic one, so one to watch. But yeah, it's uh, very much coming together now, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Stuart, for that. And I've got uh, Michelle. Yeah, I, I, just, uh, I think it's quite, there's no other comments, just to sort of pick up what you said right at the beginning, Chair, earlier, really, which is just to thank Sarah and John for the patience, really, certainly with me as well, um, because I know it's been backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. I think, Caroline, you sort of said that, you know, you've challenged, well, I, I, yeah, for, trust me. And I know I know the pictures, and I know Hillary's put a comment about the pictures, and we'll see if we can get one in relationship to a, to a town. But when we get into photos, it, 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 you know, it, it is difficult, but it actually means that the content is there or thereabouts. So, and I think I take your point that we could go on and on in relationship to doing this by committee. But when I commissioned this work a year ago, I didn't, you know, didn't appreciate just how good and how what a really high quality and advanced level that, that Sarah and John would lead this work on. Not just internally with the, the non-execs who have been particularly appreciative, challenging on and off, which is great. And um, has have the exec, has certainly have I. But also externally as well, because I think you, know, you don't underestimate how much work has been done externally in relationship to the strategy alongside our internal piece. So uh, it's it's just saying thank you so much for the work that you've done. It, it's a great piece of work. I did suggest six pages. I'm not going to go over that. It's absolutely fine as it is. I know that we can't do that. And I know you have a little titter about that. But um, those of you who know, know me very well will know that I, I really like the pages that are no longer than two document, uh, two pages long or six six pages for a strategy but it is absolutely fantastic but on a serious now i think you mentioned it sarah you have got a lot of intelligence in the supporting information about the organization about internal stakeholders external stakeholders etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think somehow um when you've recovered from this particular piece um is see if we can pull some of that together and then let's have a look at it and see how best we can use it because i don't want to lose it because you've done such a great job at collecting uh, that and i think it can really help shape some of the work that we do going forward as well so let's think collectively uh, maybe offline how we can how we can maximize that rich data but a uh, great piece of work thank you for your patience particularly and, and thank you for presenting it really well today Thanks, Michelle. Anything, um, John, Sarah, you want to add? Anything more you need from us? Just thank you very much for all your support over the last year. Brilliant. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Brilliant. Looking forward to the uh, launch. And uh, Stuart, you and I are in the same place. Um, proofreading is, uh, yeah, you can't, once you've done it in a past life, you just can't get away from it. Um, but there we go. We're trying to be helpful, Sarah and John. There we go. Right. Thank you very much. I was going to try and maybe I probably should have broken earlier, but I suggest we now stop and have a 10 minute break and come back. So it's 11.34. If we could be back at 11.44 or 11.45.
Welcome back to the uh, Trust Board meeting for Humber Teaching NHS Foundation Trust. And we are at item uh, number 13 on the agenda, which is six month review of safer staffing in our inpatient units. Over to you, Hilary. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, for those new to the board, this is a report that uh, all providers with inpatient units are, have, to have to present to the board every six months. So we've been doing this for quite quite some time now. Obviously, it builds on the monthly data that you get in the, the dashboard uh, where we look at the safer staffing. So this report's been to EMT and it's been to the Workforce Committee. Um, as, as, a, as with other reports, there's been no incidents of harm related to safer staffing. That's always one that, that we obviously watch for and, and we report on in, in the report. Um, Town and Court Inspire and Millview Lodge are the ones where we, we've got adequate assurance rather than good assurance uh, that they're safely staffed. It, if you look at those uh, that in detail, it's, it's, it's fairly minor things in the scheme of things, but all that work is ongoing at the moment and, and being overseen by Lynn and I to make sure that those units uh, next time can be uh, can come out as being uh, good rather than adequate. The good care hours per patient day is maintained and we benchmark really well. We're overall 13.5, which when you look at our peer, they're 12.5 and nationally 10.3. So 13.5 is very good. So all in all, um, given again the six months period, which is um, it's March, October to March this year, even right through the winter, to say that we we can say that we have been safely staffed, nothing uh, of any concern in terms of incidents, um, and that the quality indicators are, are all good for the units. I think that's quite a, a good position to be in uh, as we've gone into this as we go into the summer now. Care for patient days um, is now available at actual service level, so that will start to look different in the next report. We'll see what impact that has when we start to look at service level rather than across the trust. I think things will start to look different there, so uh, we'll put some more narrative uh, into that as we get that report pulling through. But happy to take any, any questions on the report, if anybody's got any. Thanks very much, Hilary. Um, are there any comments or questions from colleagues? On this report, it's very comprehensive. Uh, hang on a second. No, I can't see anybody at the moment. Any hands up? No, OK, thank you very much. And all I would just add to it at the end there is just some, some of my visits at Hillary, uh, Town and Court and other places. I know how much the staff work together to try and make sure that we have a report like this. Um, and, you know, work really as a close team to sort of, you know, call on each other. I know that, you know, that a lot of work is done at that local level uh, because of the way they work together and those good relationships. Um, so thanks very much for that report, Hilary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on then to uh, corporate part of the agenda and we have research and development report. And I think we've got Catherine with us, Dr. Michael. Is that right? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. We have Catherine with us. I can see her picture. Um, thank you once again for the opportunity to present the six monthly update report from the research department. Um, Catherine, can you hear us? Uh, you are muted if you want to unmute. Yes, um, I can. I think always, um, I think it, it's it's um, a pleasure always to talk about the research departments because the 17 years that I have been back here in this trust, uh, it has grown from a single service research department to now involving almost all the services within the trust. So I think we've got representation from mental health, primary care, and, and I think it, it, it's it's fantastic. It has grown from a, a service which we, we, a department which used to run mostly portfolio to now having a modest non-portfolio as well. So I think um, if you speak about the research department, it always punch, punches above its weight, I would say. So um, over to Kathleen for uh, the update on the research department activities. Kathleen, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Michael. Um, so I'll just pull out some of the, the highlights from this re report. It was done in May. Um, just the way the quality committee falls falls in with dates for the trust board. So um, there has been quite a decent section included in the quality accounts for the trust. So I won't go into all of the information that was that was in that. Um, but essentially, we've um, I've summarised 
last year in infographics, um, as I do usually. I've, I've changed the infographics about a bit, so hopefully they're improved from last year's. But I'll go through some of those at the end. And I've also added an appendix, which is a bit of a, a research participant story, just to kind of show the real life impact that research is, is having. Um, but we've got lots of studies running in the trust. There's some appendix um, at the back that show you the various studies that are running. Last year, we had 49 big national studies that we were a site for, as well as some local studies. Um, we also had the research team being shortlisted for the first ever um, Yorkshire and Humber Clinical Research Network Awards back in May. Um, unfortunately, we weren't then the winners, but there were many trusts that didn't even get shortlisted. So super proud that we were shortlisted in so many categories. Just going on to governance, um, where there was an annual review meeting with the CRN, the Clinical Research Network senior leadership team that took place on the 21st of June. I haven't written the results of that in here because this report was written before it, but it was a really, really positive review. They were really pleased with our performance, particularly over such um, difficult years and really impressed with our plans for the next year or two, particularly in relation to the work we're doing in primary care with our GP practices. Um, the national target is for 45% of practices to be engaged in research. We've got seven, out, at the time of writing of this report, we had seven out of eight of our practices that were recruiting, actively recruiting international research studies. And that includes um, some of the COVID studies as well. We've got a huge variety of primary care studies running now. Um, partly down to has been successful again this year with a new business case to Yorkshire and Humber CRN for further support um, to support some GP time and uh, research nurse specifically for our GP practices, which means we can continue with the work we kind of put in place last year. We did a lot of work um, engaging and looking out for studies and getting systems set up. This year, it means we can really move forward. Now we've got that funding again, and we we hope that um, the CRN will see the progress we're making and fund us again for next year. Um, the um, we are now hosting a number of regional research posts. So where the employer um, currently for four new posts, they will service the whole of Yorkshire and Humber, specifically focusing on our um, Humber and North Yorkshire um, ICB area. And we're hosting those and we'll have probably about eight by the end of this financial year. So that brings benefits to, to the trust, but most importantly, it brings benefits for our region to be able to service a lot of studies that aren't traditionally in NHS services. So they could be out in primary care, in voluntary services, in care homes. Um, just moving on to national vision, um, the NIHR produced a primary care strategy, which the themes within it are very much focused around the themes that we've identified in our research strategy, um, focusing on primary care um, as a key setting for research and making sure we're providing equitable access for people. One of the regional posts that we've recruited to is actually um, a research nurse post for um, underserved communities, so specifically around Eastern European communities, this research nurse is um, um, able to speak Eastern European languages. Um, we're also working with um, the Yorkshire and Humber region um, around an ethnic minority research inclusion project. And we're working with the Peel project locally to get more research ready communities. So all sorts of brilliant work going on. Um, the General Medical Council also has put out um, a paper around normalising research for doctors. So that's around making sure that our medics have research as part of their core business. Um, so that fits with our with our research strategy as well. So we were kind of ahead of ahead of the game, as it were, a couple of couple of years ago when we wrote that. Um, 
In terms of funding, we've we've got funding secured for this next year. At the time of writing this report, we just had an indication, but it's now been confirmed. It's not unusual for national research funding not to be confirmed at the start of a financial year. So we kind of we we run with a, a tiny bit of risk, but we, we generally know that that money is coming. It's just exactly how much is going to come. Um, we continue with some of the COVID research. Um, we continue, um, we opened up the panoramic trial in our GP practices. That's currently on, on hold, but that is open um, in terms of everything set up and we're ready to restart it again. In terms of opportunities, um, should note that approximately 40% of the national studies we were running last year were around novel interventions. So we were testing new interventions, new clinical interventions, psychosocial interventions with patients, carers, service users in our trust. Um, we've also been successful in the past year with some external research grants. We used a tiny bit of money that we got from Department of Health um, through the success of the numbers of recruits we got into studies last year. And Hannah Armit, who is one of our clinical psychologists, has now been successful in getting um, some external grants with other universities around the region. One is around a nature-based intervention for children with ADHD, and one is around using digital resources to promote research findings to people um, with severe um, mental ill health. So that's about getting research findings out and making it understandable. So it's not just research that's sitting on a sitting on a shelf somewhere. We've um, we've we're progressing with our research conference for the third of November. We've got all our speakers sorted. Um, this will be a blended conference like we did last year. Hopefully, we will have the opportunity to have some more people in the room than we did last year. Obviously, we'll see what the situation is by November, but we've got a waiting list of people that want to be there in person. So we've got, I didn't check the figures before I came on today and I should have done, but at the last count, we had about 350 people registered for the conference and we're nowhere near even running the conference yet. So um, hopefully that will be something to celebrate again. Um, I'm continuing to work with the Recovery College and... Um, Wendy Mitchell, who is a lady living with dementia, we run some recovery college sessions together. Wendy has taken part in lots of research with us and we talk about living with dementia and how research is helping people live with dementia. Um, so that's been really successful. And if we go on to the infographics, I suppose some of the key things, well, I've pulled out what I think are the key things in the infographics. Um, it's really encouraging to see 96% of people that have taken part in research would say they would take part again. Um, and we know it's a positive experience for people because people tell us all the time. Um, we were also the highest recruiter for the um, Pathfinder, which is around depression and dementia. That's a clinical trial, an intervention trial. We were the highest recruiter in England for that. Um, which is something to celebrate. As a result of people taking part in research as well, we've had 37 clinical staff trained. So this is the second infographic. 37 clinical staff in our trust receive training on new clinical interventions just because we're involved in research. So this is free training. If the research shows that this is effective, those are skills that those clinicians have got for life. Um, so that's a re another kind of sideline positive of the trust being involved in research. Obviously, it brings in funding. The more successful we are, the more funding we get and the more we can also explore um, getting involved in commercial research as well, which our pharmacy department are really keen to get involved in. Um, we also spend a lot of time with patients, carers and service users over and above their clinical contact time. So last year, we estimated, and this is a rough estimation, around 750 extra hours were spent with people by way of them being involved in research. 
And then I suppose the last thing I want to draw attention to is Appendix 3, which I hope you've had a chance to read. But it's it's a story of it's somebody that was involved in, an again, a, a novel intervention for people aged over 65 who were living with multimorbidities. And it was around a behavioural activation intervention, um, specifically around loneliness through COVID. Um, and I mean, some of the, this person wrote, wrote this little story for us about their experience in the study. And I think, you know, she says, I feel like everyone needs a researcher. Before I started this study, I felt like I wasn't worth anything. And after taking part, I feel brilliant. Um, and she's now, she, she felt very isolated in her area and she's now um, developing new friendships and helping out in the community and all sorts. Of, so it was, a, it was a fab story, but it's not the only one that we've got. Um, that's probably it. I've talked for quite a while, sorry. I, no problem, Catherine. Um, a number of people want to come. I just want to say, I think this is an excellent report. I really love the layout. Um, and I think the infographics in terms of numbers and impact and the and the case study, it just brings it alive. And to be honest, I think as a template for other update reports, it might offer something in terms of what really brings something to a, a, a live. And, uh, and for my board members and anyone watching in, you can find out more on the Twitter, uh, if you're a Twitter, if you're a tweeter, uh, at Research Humber, capital R, capital H. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Good. OK, brilliant. And looking forward to the conference. Mike. Thanks, Chair. I was just writing down Research Humber. <laughs> I don't, I've done it now. Uh, I wanted to be first in, and um, the chair obviously goes first to say, well done again. Uh, fantastic success story. I love the stuff about translational research in terms of making people really understand and use it. The, the other thing that really struck me um, was about the participation of uh, of our staff. And I was just wondering how much Steve McGowan, uh, we use this as a recruitment tool. I think that infographic is really, really good um, tool about the research in numbers to, to attract people at all levels into the trust, because we had a discussion, didn't we, previously about nurses being involved in research and student nurses and so on. So question for Steve, if I may. Steve. Um, of course you may, Mike. Um, yeah, absolutely, we do. It's included in our literature. Actually, um, hot off the press, there is a there's a video that's just been produced, which I think Catherine is actually in the video as well. So, uh, which is just about to be signed off, where we talk about all the benefits of working for the trust, uh, and one of those one of the key theme around that is is that area, Mike. So we've included that. Catherine talks about it, how how you can get involved if you come to work for us, how much we we support it and include it and make it a key part of what we do. So uh, we include it in our literature, we push it, we get it out there, we try and uh, get the message as widely spread as possible. And watch out for the video; it should be out in the next week or so. Yeah. Uh, Francis. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to reiterate the comments I made at Quality Committee. You know, really great report, some great work going on. We're punching well above our weight. Great news on the GP practices. That's great to see. <clears throat> great on the on the people who made it to the uh, to the awards. Again, really good to see. Um, in terms of your Appendix Three, I got to Appendix Two and thought, great, this is what we did last year. Just need a case study. Turn the page, and there was the <laughs> case study. So it worked really, really well. Um, and, and then again, as I mentioned at, at Quality Committee, it's great to see the first student nurse placement and how well that went. And, and did, do you want to expand the tour on that? Yeah, when actually I should say about the Appendix 3, it was because of comments from the Quality Committee that I put it in. So thank you. Um, yeah, the student nurse, um, initially we took a, a year one student nurse and it went super well. It's the first time we've ever had a student nurse. and I, I don't know why we've never done it before, to be honest. Um, so it was really good to get them engaged in research. It wasn't hands on because they were a year one student, but the, the feedback that we got from them was really, really positive. Um, and they felt like they wanted now to, to have research as part of their future career. We then took on a year. Well, we're just in the middle of um, a year three student nurse. Um, so we're, we're taking on more and more and more so it you know it, it's great and if we can embed research and and get new clinicians to see it as part of what they do 
anyway, you know, it's something we should automatically be offering to people. What better way to do it than to get right in when people are training? So it's been really positive for us as a team, but I think also for the students. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Hani. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, again echo those sentiments by by colleagues. Great report, Catherine. Just just going back to your, your comment on uh, the uh, the Eastern European community, uh, it's great to see we're taking that into account. Just taking into um, into account just the different nature of uh, the physical communities that we're having to serve. Uh, anything around transient communities, uh, including both sort of traditional transient communities, but also just from that that category of refugees, asylum seekers and the destitute, it's slightly easier with, with those that have got permanent settlement. But, but I, I know from some of the work I'm undertaking leads in a different area with those that are still within the process or are classed as destitute and not have full access to, uh, to health benefits, whether we've managed to look into that area. It's work that we haven't really done anything much on. But um, there's now a project called the Whole, Whole Research Ready Communities Project that is actually being funded nationally and is being run by the Yorkshire and Humber Clinical Research Network. And they've, they're doing some pilot projects around the um, country. And we've been chosen in Hull as one of those projects. And that's to try and reach out to exactly the sorts of communities that, we're talk that you're talking about there. Um, communities that are traditionally classed as underserved in research and harder to access. So that project is literally just starting. Um, so I hope that that might include some of the communities that you're talking about. Um, also with the Emory project, we're hoping that more work will come around the communities you're talking about. One of our research clinical psychologists also, she was unsuccessful, but did put in a bid for some research funding around traveller communities and working with female. She um, managed to get somebody from the traveller community to be part of that research grant application, met with them quite a few times. And it's quite hard sometimes to engage um, with some communities that aren't used to people from health services coming into them. Um, and Hannah, it was Hannah again, actually, who works in our team. She managed to do that in a research grant application with that person as a co-applicant. So hopefully she'll keep going with some of that research because she's really interested in that field as well. So we're, I wouldn't say we've done huge amounts yet, but we're starting to go down that road. So I hope, you know, in future board reports, I can report on some of the work that we're doing. Thank you. Great. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, thanks. Obviously, you've got my declaration of interest being obviously chair of the CRM, but just to sort of say, as I always do, just to thank Catherine for your energy, really, in, in relationship to research. And you can see that in the report. Great numbers on the research confident, uh, com conference. Really looking forward to it. But just to say that I really like the appendices in the in the report and it might be a bit of a template we want to maybe look at because I'm a bit of a visual person as well. But just some really good work that you're doing and, and just continue. And don't worry, shortlisting is, is fantastic. I know how many people applied for the award. Board. So just being shortlisted absolutely is um, is fantastic. Maybe next year, but uh, who could possibly comment? Um, but thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, no more questions, Catherine. Thank you very much. You may have picked up earlier that Abby Lee, who is part of our patient story today, has just got her a first class in her undergraduate degree in psychology, and she's heading for an MA. And we we uh, had a bit of a discussion about making sure the links with research. Mm -hmm might be there as well so um yeah all good all good all good thanks very thanks. much to you and your team thank thanks you everyone much for indeed. your support take care thanks thank Anne. you okay steve um item 15 gender pay gap report please thanks um thanks caroline so just uh, a bit of background so we report since 2017 first report in 2018 on the it's a legal requirement that we report on our gender pay gap for all all organisations that have 250 or more employees. So um, this is, I think, the fifth year that we've, we've brought this up. Our process is that we take this to EMT and then Workforce Committee and then bring it through sort of board for ratification. And that's the process that we've that we've followed this time. Um, just as a just as a, a reminder, um, this is about the difference in average pay 
between men and women. It's not about equal pay for equal work of equal value. Um, and that, I think 3.5 in the report kind of cover, covers that off. Um, with regards to our performance around that, so the mean pay is 11.4. Uh, that's an improvement of 1.5% based on the year before and is better than the national average, which is currently at 15.4%. Um, that's kind of headline figures. We also report on bonus. I'd always put a bit of a health warning on bonus. We only actually have 16 people in the organisation who get a bonus. So it's a really small number when we look at those figures, those figures overall. But we still report it as we're required to do. Um, you'll notice actually in the actions, uh, something around that bonus and uh, it was something we talked with our colleagues at the medical meeting. So the Clinical Excellence Awards, which makes predominantly nearly all of our bonus payments. Uh, there's been some national negotiations on how they are applied. Um, the last year, two years, because of COVID, they've just been applied equally uh, across the workforce. And obviously that's going to impact on how we report. Uh, we've got scope to look at that this year. We're talking to our colleagues in the medical community and executive management team will receive some proposals on that later later in this year um, to see how we're going to how we're going to how we do it. But we've got that in as an action. So that and starting salaries for medical are two of the actions that we've got in there as well. So we've improved. We're going in the right in the right direction, and that's as a result of a number of actions. So the key things that we talked about at workforce committee are some of those actions that we're continuing to do. Uh, so we talked about our leadership programs, our high potential development scheme, our coaching uh, career conversations for female staff in particular. Uh, but one of the topics that we talked about was actually looking at our lower paid staff and understanding those staff that actually aren't paid on agenda for change. So we know that as a result of being successful in the old world of winning contracts or taking on primary care uh, services that actually we inherit people who inherited a workforce that aren't on agenda for change and in often that will be at the bottom end of the of of pay and some in some cases on on kind of minimum pay rates now that's fine and legally we're we're secure on that because 2p applies when those staff move across to us but there is some work to look at that to see whether they could move across into agenda for change uh, executive management team in a conversation earlier this year gave a commitment to look at that as part of the budget round for next year so we've included that in the actions that we'll take forward as well uh, that that group of that group of that workforce is predominantly female so that may well if we can make an offer for people to look at agenda for change will have a positive impact on the overall average pay it's not a huge number of staff but it's still a it's still a kind of significant and i would argue symbolic number as well so um, we talked about it at workforce committee we proposing that this is signed off at board happy to take any questions thank you steve any questions please no i can't see any there that was pretty comprehensive steve thank you for that and of course the workforce committee has discussed this in more depth as well um and therefore are, are we are we ratifying or approving it says to approve on the uh, uh, on the front sheet ratify uh, Good question. Oh. I think I'm yeah, we are. Yeah, I don't, you know, Mr. Royals, Mr. Royals will be coming down on me on a, like a ton of bricks yeah, if I get yeah. this wrong. Okay. So why I, I, was, I was worried when I was saying that. I could see Dean looking <laughs> and thinking, you know. <laughs> No, we are the proving okay. we are the proving body for this paper. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Exec. Um, okay, is everyone approved this report? Okay, no dissent there. Thank you very much. Lots of thumbs up. Thank you. Let's move on to the external review of governance action plan update, Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not going to labour this. That you've seen it several times before. You know the detail um, really well. This is just an update. We did say we'd bring monthly updates to the board on the external review of governance. Just to note, there's no uh, um, issues to raise. All recommendations have been progressed. Um, so basically, the 23 recommendations all have been addressed in some form or other. There are four still in progress, and that's due to timelines. The appraisal one, we, we slightly amended the timeline because we needed to wait for the appraisal window to close. So we've now got that out and we've got the template out and the information is going back into the um, HR department. So that is ongoing. Um, we will review embeddedness because for me, the important is, is embeddedness and some of the recommendations. So we'll bring that back in quarter three, but it's just there for update, uh, Chair, or if there's any questions at this stage. But I'll leave it there because we've seen it loads of times before, but nothing to escalate our report. Thanks very much, Michelle. Any questions or comments? 
No, thank you very much. Let's move on then to uh, annual non-clinical safety report. And we've got Rob Atkinson with us, who's head of estate. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Rob. No problem at all. Over Afternoon, to you. Everybody. Thank you very much, Chair. So, yeah, I've, uh, I've got the annual non-clinical safety report uh, that's been, been provided. There's just a key, a uh, few key highlights that I would like to go through if I could. So all safety related policies have been reviewed and submitted for comment and approved through the health and safety group. There's no safety related policies that are out of date. The latest one was a health and safety policy, which was uh, was taken to the group and approved in June. So all are in date. Safety assessments for the trusts have been completed, all found to be compliant with the ex exception of evacuation exercises being completed. Uh, it's a common theme uh, across across these trust estate, and particularly given the the COVID working and the and the flexible working. So that's something that we've been working with the the building managers on to ensure that they're they're coming back in line with expectations of two uh, two annual exercises a year. So that's something that we're working through, and that's been monitored through the health and safety group. In terms of incident reporting, we've had uh, uh, six. Uh, in terms of radar, radars, we've had six violence and aggression, two slips and trips, and one that was part of a food preparation. Uh, it was a, it was a cut. So th they've uh, they've been included in the report, and the the actions that have been taken and any lessons learned have been taken from those. In terms of fire, we've had uh, three actual fire incidents through the through the trust. Two was uh, within bedroom accommodation, and that was a it was a patient that had. had, had maliciously uh, created a fire. One was accidental, which was food was left uh, unattended. We've had uh, 34 false alarm activations, which is an increase in 10.2% from 30 to 34. This has been identified as being caused by contractors and uh, accidental damage to the, uh, the the call points, generally with, with by patients. So we, we, we are, I think we're understanding, well, we certainly are understanding of why these have occurred and we're working to, particularly with a contractor element to ensure that they're, they're not repeated. In terms of unwanted fire alarm signals, they've been reduced from uh, it by 63%, decreased from 98 to 62 due to staff being uh, more proactive, vigilant and de-escalating situations. So that's that's been real positive. Also, we're introducing a new type of fire detector across uh, across the inpatient facilities, which are, are less obvious as a fire detector, but I've been misidentified as as being potential cameras, which has been a bit of work by the staff on the ground to to ensure that patients are aware that they're they're not cameras, but they are they are more safe to use and, and less likely to be uh, damaged and, and used for other other purposes. Out of the 62 unwanted fire signals, 34 fire activations of the fire service attended trust buildings on five occasions, and two, two of those were actual incidents. So what this is showing is that the call filtering system that we've got in place that uh, works through our call handling centre that's managed by SCAMP is, is working well that by means of that the call handling centre take, uh, take direction. There's a three-minute call filter from live sites and they acknowledge if there's an actual fire incident or not, and that is then confined, to, confined back to the fire service. So that, that ensures that we, we were, we're not, we haven't got the, the fire service turning up on all activations, but ensure that we've got safe, safe procedures in place. In terms of uh, security incidents, uh, we've uh, had a number of CCT requests by the police, uh, and that's basic, basically in relation to assaults. Uh, we've had an upgrade of CCTV at Miranda House, and there's further upgrades that are uh, being undertaken at um, Inspire, and that, but that's more recent outside of this reporting cycle. We've had uh, 21 unacceptable behaviour letters that have been sent to service users for being verbally abusive towards a wide, wide range of staff, and uh, I know this has been discussed more recently in relation to uh, the trust and trauma-informed, uh, being a trauma-informed organisation, and now we apply this to ensuring that uh, unacceptable behaviours is dealt with, but at the same time, we're, we're, it's undertaken in a manner that's that's working with with patients and our service users. In terms of training, we've got safety related training as baseline of 85%, and all the fire and health and safety training is within the 90% range. Display screen and cost training has been incorporated with the health and safety awareness course, and this is due to both elements not being there mandatory any longer. 
the team continue to uh, liaise with the fire service and, and the police service and we've got an extremely good working relationship with them and whenever we've had any uh, attendance on sites that that's been proven has been quite a positive what we are seeing from uh, from what I said earlier in terms of the evacuation exercises and so on is the importance of the uh, the local management on site which is which works closely with with uh, the state's team and the safety team to ensure that we have specific elements in place which is in relation to fire wardens first aiders and and ensuring that we have all the weekly and monthly checks and evacuation exercises undertaken which is something that we we need to bear in mind when we're moving forward with the blended model to to working across the organization because we have got a more transient population that's working through our buildings and therefore because we're quite dispersed we need to make sure that that, that coverage is in place and that's something that's been uh, picked up and monitored by the health and safety group so in summary uh, we're ensuring that the safe working environment and removal of control of identified risks continues and trust being found to be compliant and in, in line with regulatory imposed uh, requirements imposed by local enforcing authorities so that's that's the summary of the of the uh, of the report in general it was, uh, it, was, it was authored by our safety manager paul dent and uh, i'd take any questions if you if you have any thanks very much um rob for that are there any questions from colleagues francis just to say this came to to FIC last week and we complimented Paul on, on an excellent report. He's developed it from last year look, and, and looked at the structure of it. It was really good. Um, we also complimented him and the team because picking up on Rob's point, they developed a course, online course for fire wardens and that's now being picked up externally and is being sold to, to other trusts. So we were we thought it was a, a great report and, and showed the comprehensive understanding we have of, of risks from a non-clinical perspective. Thanks very much for that, Francis. Uh, Steve, and then Mike. Thanks, um, thanks, Rob. Really comprehensive report. Uh, some really good information in there. I think it's worth just picking up on the increased um, acts of aggression and violence towards our staff. Um, thank you for taking us through the process, the warning letters, you know, and, and equally, I know actually last week, you, your team, the team did a presentation to managers to kind of reinforce that process and ensure what we do. But I think as a board, it's just worth noting that increase that's that we've seen towards our staff. Uh, and, uh, you know, we should be kind of and we are calling out that kind of how abhorrent it is that our staff in doing their work are getting verbally abused in, and, and are subject to that in their day to day duties. And I think it's to give the board assurance that we're there to support our staff through that and making sure that we've got a number of things in place to address it when it happens and support staff but i'm sure all the board would want to call out how unacceptable it is for our staff in trying to deliver their duties are sometimes subject to that type of behavior absolutely steve 100 percent uh mike and um, thanks for the, the report and for the way that paul has done on it as well really comprehensive and um, we see it once a year and it just it bumbles along below below the surface but it doesn't bumble on along you've got some real grip on this i'm really pleased with that just a, a quick question has there been any feedback from the fire service are they duly grateful for what we do uh, <laughs> they, they are they are grateful for the systems that we've got in place so obviously we don't um we, we don't have the attendance that we have had in the past and and similarly by virtue of the uh, the requirements for for them as the enforcing authority to come down and undertake any reviews on the site so by virtue of that we, we do have a good working relationship and, and we do get good feedback from them great we have a new um governor on coming on from the homicide fire service in september jonathan henderson if i remember collect correctly he's going to be um our new rep from from the fire service so you know maybe there's an opportunity there as a new governor to make that connection as well uh stuart uh, yeah very briefly just to add uh, robert um, when we discussed the report with paul at the finance committee in the last week we also touched on how the trust supports staff with their mental health as well as their as well as well as their physical health so no, i know it's not covered in the ambit of the report but i think we wanted to make that connection which we were happy with so just to add that thank you thanks stuart okay that's all the hands up that i can see is there anything you wanted to add to anything rob no i think i just echo everything that everyone said in terms of the uh, the support that we've received it's uh, it, it it's really it's really great and, and we don't do any of this without 
uh, the support of operations because it, it really links in with the operation on Leeds and, and the need to have the eyes and ears that are going on on site. So thank you for, for that. Thank you. I think Michelle would just like to say something. Yeah, I've said this many times before, but I'm going to say it again and I'll probably embarrass Rob, but just thanks to Rob and the, 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 the team really for Tilted and Estates because the amount of work that you're doing as quickly as you do it and how you are you know, really responsive is amazing really all the way through COVID, but all the way through, be it you know, incidents that we have in the involved you know, states work, etc. But just what a great team. So, so thanks, Rob. It's a pleasure to work with you all. Thank you. Ditto. Thank you very much, Rob. Pass the thanks back to everybody else. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for Thank waiting you. as well, your patience. OK, moving on then to item 18. We're on to the ICB. Michelle, over to you, the Integrated Care Board. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear your feedback, really, because I just thought it'd be interesting yeah. now the ICB is a is a established um, board just to receive these the minutes as they as they come through. Obviously, as they've been approved, I know it says draft on it, but they have been approved because they were approved at the 18th of um, July meeting. Just to the board, I just thought they'd be quite interesting. I'll pick out anything as we go through, but obviously they're fairly dry because they've only had two meetings. The first meeting was a setup meeting, which made most of the sunny financial instructions, etc. Um, but I just thought they'd be interested just to have a look at, you know, so they're here um, and we mentioned the organisational developing structures and the development of um, the, um, the, the the appointments and the structures as they go through. But they're just here for information unless people want me to pick anything out. Obviously, I think they'll develop as they go through, but just for information at the moment, Chair. OK, that's brilliant. Well, let's take eight, item 18 and 19 together. One is about this governance, one about the minutes and any questions to um, Michelle. Nope. OK. Right. OK, so received a note. If you if anything occurs to you, please get in touch with Michelle if you've got any queries about anything or, or myself for that matter. Thank you very much. We'll move on then to item 20. Uh, Francis, Finance and Investment Committee Assurance Report, please. You're on mute, Francis. Always wants, and there's always wants. So, um, we've covered most of this in, in previous reports. Uh, we had our normal discussion on finance and gain assurance on, on our performance year to date, but also discussed the potential issues from the pay increase. Uh, we then had quite a focus on agency costs and on primary care. And you can see that we've escalated to board that we think that the committee felt that the quality committee should look at and gain assurance on the use of agency staff, as well as looking at it from a financial perspective perspective so picking up on the point I made earlier about making sure it's looked at by all of the committees um, and similarly we felt that um, we should have a, uh, a discussion at one of our board strategic sessions around primary care in terms of the, the deficit and the options that are available and, and talk that through and then bring it back to a public board following that discussion. Uh, we had a look at the non-clinical safety report um, and we got assurance from that uh, and that's the probably the key things I would pull out Thank you very much, Francis. Any questions from anybody to Francis? OK, that's received and noted. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Dean, uh, Workforce Organisation Committee Assurance Report Minutes. Yeah, thank you. You've got the um, the uh, report there and the, um, the the items that were raised. Um, we touched on earlier, we, we, we did pick up the impact of the cost of living report at the time we did the, the Workforce Committee, the pay award uh, hadn't been uh, approved so it was uh, already a number of months out of date and we thought that was an impact of that um, but clearly that's been picked up in uh, Michelle's report. I, I suppose it's worth noting there that in terms of the cost of living uh, although I, I know that uh, trade unions will still be deciding what to do about the uh, uh, the pay award um, it, it is a higher increase for staff at the lower end of the pay scale I think which will be welcome for many uh, but clearly as you got the pay scale that then becomes less you know so there's a there's, there's a consequence how you look at that. Um, other things to pick up, uh, I suppose, is um, we, we looked at the uh, uh, EDI report, the sort of annual EDI report. Uh, in this trust, we look at that from a, a staff perspective, but also uh, in terms of service users and access to services uh, sort of coming through. So although it was due to be at the board uh, for this meeting, felt it was appropriate for that to go to quality committee in the first instance before it comes to the next uh, board meeting. And that may be something that uh, we want to have a, a broader board discussion about as as well on there. And we'd also picked up that uh, I'd attended now the three subgroups in line with the well uh, led review. So it's good to uh, see those. Um, we picked up from one of those about the um, 
exec team looking at sort of admin support to the uh, to the BAME network, uh, which I know that they're uh, having a look at uh, having a look at that, and uh, just that we're receiving regular deep dive reports. And I suppose as, again, as part of that, uh, a thing to note is. Um, you know, the number of levers is rising. Um, and this is something that had been predicted, I think, during COVID where, um, you know, for loyalty reasons and, uh, you know, in the lack of other employment and things during the COVID period, a turnover did decline. So I think what we'll see there is some, if you like, latent demand or some deferred leaving uh, that's taking place. But the team are looking at that reasons and trying to get more information about what we can do to uh, encourage people to stay in is an important part of, uh, of retention. But again, happy happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dean. Any questions to Dean? No, I can't see any there. Thank you very much, Dean, for that report. Uh, moving on then to the Collaborative Committee, Stuart. Thank you. Yep, Collaborative Committee met at the end of June. And uh, you'll see from my highlight report, the focus has been uh, very much on the performance of the Schoen Clinic and how to provide oversight and support in order to uh, get it back into a kind of a, a business as usual position. Um, and uh, we're receiving now weekly data, uh, giving a sense of progress, which is uh, going in, in largely in the right direction. So that's one thing for you to be aware of. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw to your attention is that we we had a, uh, a stop take of the, of, the, of the role of the committee uh, and what we identified was it was it was kind of meeting too frequently. So it was meeting too frequently for the supporting committees, the supporting work streams to do their work efficiently um, and then report back to us. So we've taken a view that we'll now uh, meet on a kind of a probably a, a two monthly basis. And we've invited uh, the lead managers to give us a proposal about how that will work in order to both uh, reduce the frequency and effectiveness, I think, of the committee and to streamline the reporting because we were producing uh, too, too many items to do the, the work justice. So that's another key thing, to, I think, in terms of governance for you to be aware of. And then finally, just to confirm that one, one of those well-led review action points about the composition of the committee has now has been discharged in reality. So another one we can tick off uh, on that list of things that we wanted to do. So I shall stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Stuart. That's really interesting about the committee and some changes and fits in with our broader discussion around the board, which Michelle and Michelle Hughes, Michelle Moran, Michelle Hughes, I think Francis are picking up later in August. Thank you very much for that. Any questions to Stuart? No. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if you move on to Council of Governors, um, just to say, I think there's half a sentence missing on the front sheet. We're under the positive assurance to provide. It does state there that the meeting was not core. However, we emailed individual governors to make sure that anything had approval went around the whole group of governors who had voting rights on those issues. Um, so I think Jenny's going to add that in at a later date. Um, as I said earlier, the main one of the main items on the agenda was uh, agreeing the um, development proposals and support proposals for governors that went through um, uh, the committee. And, and also, I think just, you know, not actually not at this one and the last one, but the work started at this April uh, Council of Governors meeting. So it's taken us about three months, but the work started pretty much here. Any questions? Nope. OK, thank you very much. Um, any items for escalation? No. Um, any other business? No. OK, well, thank you very much uh, for your participation today. Philip, I hope that's been an interesting introduction to the board. Be interested to see, hear your views uh, separately. Hopefully we will all be meeting together in person in the not too distant future. So uh, for all of us, for anybody watching, that's the end of the public board meeting. And uh, thank you for taking part. <laughs>